totally saw this as a an industry conspiring together to bring a certain idea into popular mainstream thought. But that was already known that estrogen causes miscarriage in the 1930s. Then with the development of birth control pills, it finally came out that DES was causing cancer. So the whole medical establishment was lied to. Hundreds, thousands of lying publications in all the best medical journals. This is not an opinion. This is not channeled from Atlantis. This is science. Why is there an explosion of chronic disease? Like, why have so many people got chronic diseases and at a younger and younger age? So this is mind-blowing, if true. Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwin Robinson. And today we're talking about some of the most controversial and interesting theories of Dr. Raymond Pete. We had already done one full episode, so you might want to check that out. And today we are continuing the conversation because there are quite a few that we want to take a nice deep dive into and look further at. Now, Dr. Raymond Pete was a PhD in biology with a specialization in physiology from the University of Oregon. Dr. Pete specialized in studying the hormone progesterone in 1968 along with other hormones like thyroid hormone and has continued to study the role of progesterone and endocrinology in the body. Now, Ellen, I know we already had have completed episode one discussing some of these controversial and interesting theories. So tell me, I know we didn't get quite through the list, but um, you know, why do you feel it's important to carry on the conversation? It's a good question. Um, people, I think, uh, are getting more into the theories of repeat these days. And I think overall, that's a very good thing. The thing that I really admire about the man, I do think he was a genius. That doesn't mean that he's right about everything. Of course, uh, geniuses rarely are right about everything. But the thing that makes him a genius to me is that he really examined things from first principles, things that everyone else takes for granted as just undisputable facts, like the very presuppositions of a lot of our understanding of human biochemistry, health. Um, he questions and in fact often has completely opposite opinions. He may not always be right about those, and I'll give obviously my perspective on them as well as we'll provide as much as we can quotes from the man himself because he's no longer with us, so quotes are the best we can do rather than an actual live interview. Um, but it's very important because he may well be right about things. And even if he's not 100% right, even if he's only partly right, if he if what he's saying is the exact opposite, not just of what everyone in the kind of mainstream medical establishment says, because there's a lot of people who are saying stuff opposite to that, but what he says is often also opposite to everyone in the alternative stroke natural health world. Um, and so if he's right about that, then, um, you know, it, it's worth sharing. And he is becoming more popular. I think this often happens with geniuses. Their work is not truly appreciated until after they die. And that's exactly what has been happening the last few years. Um, and I would say that when I first came across him, it was over 10 years ago. And I was, you know, uh, I don't think I agreed with anything that he said back then. And it's taken me a long time to realize that actually he was right about a lot. So... Uh, I just want to um, really give those theories justice. And also, I, to me, this is one of the fun episodes, you know, when we do an episode where we go really deep diving on a root cause topic. I have to do a lot of research and preparation for that. And I guess I've done a lot of research on these two because they're of interest to me. But to me, this is more just like a, a fun conversation where we can talk about these icon classic ideas, a lot of which I agree with, but... Um, we can uh, explore them in depth. Fantastic. Well, let's jump straight on in. So the first one is estrogen is not the primary female hormone. It's a stress hormone. If there is such a thing as a primary female hormone, it's progesterone. Having children increases a woman's health. Yeah, so that latter one, having children increases a woman's health. Oh, just to remind people, so most of these, though I've added a few of my own today, uh, originally come from tweets from a uh, Twitter user um, which whose name I can't even pronounce, but we'll make sure we put the treat underneath uh, the episode again to give uh, them credit for uh, sparking the idea of doing these episodes. So yeah, what we're taught is that estrogen is the primary female hormone, um, that it's good, that the problems associated with menopause um, and even premenopause are uh, mainly down to lack of estrogen and that getting more estrogen is a good thing. Um, we're taught that progesterone is kind of like a, a secondary irrelevant thing and certainly something that's only relevant to women um, who are menstruating and nothing else. And Dr. P taught something so radically different from that that 
it's worth exploring, especially because he's not like someone who is, and no offense to these people, but who has channeled this information from fifth dimensional Atlantic aliens. He's actually doing it based on a, a vast amount of scientific literature which supports what he's saying, right? So these are not um, just ideas. There's actually a wealth of evidence that these things are 100% true, which for some reason never got caught on and suppressed uh, and was suppressed. And it's easy to be conspiratorial about these things and there may be conspiracy involved, but it, of course it may also just be error. People sometimes get things wrong, the wrong ideas catch on, this has happened throughout history. Uh, people have made mistakes and once a mistake is ingrained, it's often very hard to change. As the famous uh, uh, physicist Robert Feynman uh, said, I believe, if I'm quoting correctly, um, scientific progress usually happens one funeral at a time. Meaning that, you know, once a scientist has got an idea in their head, usually you have to wait until those that generation of scientists die and a new generation can come in and kind of replace it. Now, if you add to that the massive incentive of funding, both from um, corporations, both from business, but also funding from government that have their own agendas and that are much more intertwined than we would ideally like them to be. I think everyone would agree on that then we can see where there's a lot of realm for error, where error can really uh, take over. And of course, some of Dr. Ray Pete's ideas may be error, and we, we can't be sure about that, but I feel like it's worth at least uh, exploring them. So yeah, on the subject of estrogen and progesterone, this is such a huge thing because, of course, this is something that women suffer with, certainly by the time they hit menopause, I think, pretty much every woman suffers with menopause and then they suffer from being postmenopausal. These days, more and more women are suffering even way before the menopause from all kinds of hormonal issues, whether it's PCOS, whether it's, uh, you know, PMS, whether it's uh, lack of fertility, all kinds of issues that may be down to this fundamental misunderstanding about the female hormones. So as you said, there's two basic parts to what he was saying there. Number one, that estrogen is, although it serves a function and is necessary for childbirth uh, and, and uh, um, conception, that it's not good overall, that you would want to keep it as low as possible other than for that purpose. That's uh, Ray Pete's um, uh, pot, what, the, the idea that he's putting forth. And then the other idea being that the main hormone that keeps women healthy and keeps women um, feeling good for as long as possible is actually progesterone. There's an extension to that, which is that it may also be key to men feeling good too. But the thing is that men also have testosterone and the metabolites of that, which we'll talk about later, which help them feel good. My understanding is in terms of hormones, really the primary hormone that makes a woman feel good is progesterone. So we'll get into that. We'll get into uh, Ray Pete's quotes on that. Perfect. Yeah, let's do this one. It says, in, in the 1930s, around the time that just before the polyunsaturated fats were discovered to be very toxic, estrogen was considered a toxic inflammation promoting hormone. And it was only a huge propaganda campaign by the estrogen industry that created the idea that it's the female hormone. And just to uh, remind uh, the censors on whatever platform this is being watched on, we are quoting Ray Pete. This is not something that we were saying. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, as I said, he totally saw this as a you know uh, an, an industry conspiring together to uh, bring a certain idea into popular mainstream thought, which is in the 30s it was considered toxic and inflammation promoting and um they put a lot of work as we'll describe he'll describe in detail in this quote into convincing the scientific establishment the medical establishment and then everyday people like you and me downstream of that that actually was a good thing perfect all right, here we go. Males, old men who are under stress or younger men who had either a traumatic accident or is very sick, man's estrogen will rival the peak estrogen production of young women. So it's absolutely not a female hormone. It's just a stress-related or traumatic response hormone. It helps to renew cell production, which seems to be why it's associated with a traumatic injury. It has the effect of creating new cells. In the uterus, that's what it does. It causes uterine growth and preparation of a rapid multiplication of the lining of the uterus uterus in preparation to receive the implanted embryo. So it is something that leads to growth. And so that's why I say it's essential for the conception process. But you see, he's talking about the prolif proliferation of cells. Well, that 
what happens to the proliferation of cells especially when they're you know it's un uncontrolled and, and, and mutated well that's what we often refer to as you know the t word the c word and that's you know depending on the country the number one or number two cause of death so people who get really deep into understanding estrogen without bias often that's one of the main things that they dislike about it um in fact that's most commonly the main thing they dislike about it is this um unrestrained multiplication of cells becoming potentially fatal. Uh, yes, he carries on to say, but that function is wound related. In effect, it creates a small injury reaction in the uterus to multiply cells, preparing it for the latter action of progesterone to mature the cells. And it was very early recognized to be interacting, causing the toxic effects of polyunsaturated fats to increase. And all of the effects of polyunsaturated fats were seen to be amplified by estrogen and vice versa. Yeah, so Ray Pete is also one of the first people who brought into public consciousness the idea that polyunsaturated fats, especially omega-6 fats, or often called seed oils, are actually not beneficial from he for health at all. Although he's one of the first people to bring that idea back because, again, around that same time, around the 30s, they were considered to be highly toxic, and then there was, again, a big push, a big campaign led by in seed oil industry, funnily enough, mm. um, to see it as a healthy thing. So what he's talking about there is the, uh, they, the two make each other worse. If you have estrogen and no polyunsaturated fats, you're in a much better position, or if you have polyunsaturated fats but very low estrogen, you're in a much better position. The two will uh, feed into each other and make the effects of each much worse. Right, it's kind of like kindling. It's just going to, yeah, spark more, more flames. Yes. Yep. Uh, he carries on. Stress increases your estrogen to progesterone ratio, and you experience stress more easily when something is interfering with progesterone production. Most often, low thyroid is responsible because thyroid and estrogen are inverse re inversely related. If a woman takes as much thyroid hormone as makes them feel just right, maximally efficient, they might reduce their menstruation to the extent that they don't even know they're cycling. But there is such a close inverse relationship between thyroid and estrogen. You can pretty much control your estrogen level by adjusting your thyroid. So thyroid is something we've talked a lot about in the last episode in terms of Ray Pete's view on it, and it's something I've talked about in several episodes before as well. Uh, Ray Pete was a huge proponent of adding thyroid. As we talked about in the last episode, he believed that actually, until it was made illegal in most Western countries, everyone would be naturally supplementing thyroid in the foods they ate when they ate you know, the whole uh, chicken in a soup or a whole fish in a soup or whatever, there's always some thyroid hormone coming from the animal into the food. And of course, it can be, um, it can very well be taken up orally, which is why, you know, tablets are what are given to this day. So from his perspective, you know, I mean, there are many reasons for it. But one of the reasons why uh, we're so unhealthy is because we have that lack of thyroid. And so many things that he talks about that are toxic and bad for us, like two we just mentioned, excess estrogen or polyunsaturated fats, uh, if we had enough thyroid, they'd be a lot less bad for us. And so he's giving an example there about how thyroid can help with excess estrogen. He carries on. And when you're under stress, you suppress your thyroid function, and so your estrogen rises. And estrogen, by creating inflammation and inefficient metabolism in the uterus, causes reduced... Sorry, I think there might be a misprint in here. Yeah. Um, I'll carry on. The estrogen is washing both glucose and oxygen, and so it's starving the tissues and will cause miscarriage because it kills the embryo and causes inflammation and contraction of the uterus. So it both damages the embryo and tends to expel it prematurely. And thyroid is the basic thing to lower the estrogen. Get your progesterone back up so that it is anti-inflammatory, relaxes the uterus, and protects the embryo. So there's a lot going on in here. Yeah, Dr. Pete actually spent a long time looking into pregnancy what's involved in a healthy pregnancy what's involved in a health unhealthy pregnancy he wasn't just focused on um you know how to help women be healthier how to help people be healthier he's specifically focusing on that aspect of it how to give birth to a healthy child in the first place what stops that happening what increases the chance of that happening um so yeah is that clear chrissy do we uh need to break that down at all i'd like to i'd like to break it down a little bit there yeah absolutely because th there's this you know you know one they're inversely related yeah let's go into it a little bit more because i know that there's a lot of women out there and a few 
with quite a few people I know that have had miscarriages along the way and not quite understanding it, especially the balances balance within this the hormone cycle. So yeah, let's 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 get into it a little bit. So in a nutshell, what Dr. Pete is saying here is that estrogen is high, highly inflammatory, and the worst thing about it that he's just said there, from his perspective, is that it makes the metabolism less efficient. Metabolism, if there was one word that really defined Dr. Peach teachings to me, as I understand it, it is metabolism. Everything that you looked at is, you know, improving metabolism is good and everything that uh, slows down or makes metabolism less efficient is bad. He looked at it from that perspective. Um, and so he, what he's saying there is that estrogen, because of that inflammatory um, metabolism damaging quality, uh, if it's excessive in relation to progesterone, and we'll talk about progesterone next, can often lead to miscarriage. And so he's saying higher thyroid and higher progesterone in relation to estrogen will protect the baby, protect the uh, um, prevent miscarriage, and the opposite will do the opposite. It, did, it does talk. He does talk a lot about uh, stress and that you know estrogen rises with stress. But let's say somebody's not stressed but maybe they have a high estrogen i mean like how can they tell if that like where that ratio or that balance is coming in especially if they're having miscarriages or things like that what would be the next step well so that's interesting and again so i think most people as i said who research estrogen honestly will come to the conclusion that it's not good to have it high Dr. Pete was more unusual in his evaluation of estrogen though because he firmly squarely as we said in the quote uh, sees it as a stress hormone. So meaning you don't actually have high estrogen without having stress from his point of view. So because yes, stress leads to high estrogen, but conversely, high estrogen creates stress by creating inflammation, by lowering thyroid hormone, like it said earlier, as we've talked about a lot when we talk about thyroid, if your body is not producing enough energy through thyroid stoking the metabolism enough, then it has to use the backup system, which is stress. So we could say increased estrogen will increase inflammation, will reduce thyroid function. Reduced thyroid function means the stress chemicals have to go up. So yeah, from his point of view, there would not be a situation where you're not stressed and your estrogen is high. And those things, so we were looking at biochemical stress, not necessarily external. I mean, yeah, you could still have the external trauma stress that's coming in and causing causing that stress, but there could be, there's internal biochemical stress that's going on within the system, correct? Absolutely, yeah. I think we talked about this recently. Maybe it was um, not in the Ray P episode, but the, you know, how, <laughs> how does a person know if they're stressed or not, right? And it's actually not an easy question to answer because people adapt to not only, you know, very awful situations often and consider it normal, but in the same way that a person who's brought in a situation of abuse and torment and trauma and rape and, uh, uh, you know, the worst horrific things, especially if that's everyone around them is also going through that, will consider that to be normal on a very deep level. Um, so if you've got none of that horrible stuff going on to you externally, but you have an internal environment which is horrific and traumatic and turmoil inducing and all the rest of it even if the outside world looks like a disney movie um you know you'll still feel terrible if that's what's going on inside you and again you can adapt to that and think of that is completely normal um and so the other reason why high estrogen always correlates with stress from dr pete's point of view i used thyroid as one example but the other example that he already just mentioned that's huge is progesterone, which we'll talk about soon. But one of the main things that progesterone does is to reduce stress. And so if you have high estrogen in relation to progesterone, the estrogen suppresses the progesterone. He was just saying that in the quote as well. Um, and so your anti-stress hormone is being suppressed. And so you're, you're going to experience stress. Now, I think he was also of the um, perspective that I am that although some of this is lifestyle a lot of it is gene genetic so mm -hmm. people are just born with high estrogen often called estrogen dominance and low progesterone we talked about this a bit uh when i did the interview with dr michael platt uh, a few episodes ago so you know um you can uh, go into that if you want to hear a little bit more about that from someone other than me but that is another you know significant factor so a person could be born and so for instance you know if you had a difficult birth 
if you know your mother miscarries before they you know managed to have you if um you had colic when you were first born if your mother had postpartum depression when you were first born if your mother struggled to get pregnant before you were born all of these things are indicators from the perspective that your mother was estrogen dominant maybe your father as well um and then if both of your parents but of course the mother's more key in this scenario and then if your parents, especially your mother was estrogen dominant, then there's a good chance that you are. And if you, in fact, if both your parents were, you definitely will be. And so then you will have this stressed, you know, more easily overwhelmed, less resilient, more reactive, less able to just really relax and be present. It doesn't always show up negatively. You know, you might be a super high achiever, type A kind of person, it, but even if you're very successful in the world, it often will show up as some kind of health issue, whether it's allergies, intolerances, um, uh, digestive issues. These are like some of the most common um, early manifestations, maybe chronic infections. Uh, so these are all like indicators that you may be having stress, even though you don't even realize it. And it's only when you start to shift that by following the advice of people like Dr. Pete to a degree or me or, or Dr. Platt or whoever who are teaching us how to get out of this state of running on high stress chemicals and into the state of running on high ATP, a good metabolism, then we can start to actually feel what it's like not to be stressed. So it's a tricky one. The test that I gave last time that I'll just briefly mention again is, are you able to sit still with no input, you know, maybe a like a blindfold thing and headphones without any sound and and just be present for 20 minutes without feeling in any way either agitated or exhausted can you just be present for a period of time most people cannot uh and that's not a knock on them that's not saying they're lacking discipline or anything that that's saying that they're in a horrible situation of chronic stress maybe often without even realizing it and so um but it's possible to escape from that and it's hard to believe that i mean for me you know I, I had it my whole life, my parents did, you know, everyone in my family, the friends I tended to be around, like everyone is in a state of stress. And often, you know, with that stress, there's drama and there's overwhelm and there's, you know, re emotional reactivity and there's, there's not a lot of centered calmness and there's not a lot of joy and there's not a lot of, you know, inner peace. And, but all of that's possible. And although learning to think differently and relate differently and all that kind of stuff is very important and helps with that and can even help a lot, especially if the person's very disciplined with it. I found that shifting what we're talking about here, the fundamental balance of hormones and neurotransmitters and you know, going from inflammatory to not inflammatory and basic stuff like that, going from glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation which is basically like where your body is good at creating lots of atp out of the food you eat um will just shift everything yeah you make some really valid great points there because i remember looking at some things that this was a new thing for me like yes there's the krebs cycle where your atp is coming but then there's also something called the cori cycle which is that when you're creating your atp out of stress you're actually creating it from a deficit so no wonder everyone's fatigued no one everybody's here because they just they when they're trying to make the atp that way there's just not enough it's never enough so it's never enough. yeah yeah no but it's great that you say that there is a way to get beyond it so i love that I love that and I love this. But if it's a habit that isn't just like the last few years of your life, we're talking about a habit that probably goes back many, many generations. So this is the thing when people, you know, they take one supplement or like, you know, start adding one food in or something and they're like, well, I'm not better, it doesn't work. It's like, I'm not trying to make excuses. Like you should actually be able to feel really differently after a you know, relatively short period of time if you really do everything that I suggest. But it's still, you've got to understand the, the, the amount of uh, entropy, the amount of momentum that you are trying to change, right? The momentum is very much to be in a stress state. And, and also, you know, by that time, it is also a neurological habit to be in a stress state. You know, it's very easy to go down that neurological pathway of reactivity rather than being present and open. <laughs>
like when a dog barks during a podcast. <laughs> Can't control it. <laughs> so he goes on to say with the, the next quote, he says, my dissertation advisor did research testing the effect of just a little bit extra estrogen on animals that had been fertilized. At the first week when they were ready to implant the embryo, just the tiniest bit of extra estrogen caused them not to implant the embryo. The second week when it was implanted, it took just a little more estrogen and they would kill the embryo and expel it each week of advanced development of the embryo. It just just took a little more estrogen added to kill the embryo and cause miscarriage. And that was in the 1950s, but that was already known that estrogen causes miscarriage in the 1930s. And despite that knowledge, the estrogen industry managed to convince the world that estrogen was not only the female hormone, but was helpful for pregnancy and preventing miscarriages. I won't say much about that section, except for I know it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that they would do a bunch of research on a hormone, find that it causes miscarriages, and then give it to women to prevent miscarriages. And so that I've often said, like, in the crazy world that we currently live in, people who have bad parents are actually at an advantage because we kind of instinctively don't trust authority. Um, so I understand if you've had like, you know, really wonderful authority figures in your life, it can be really hard to imagine why would they do such a thing that can't be true you know and so i don't expect you to believe me or dr ray p but if you're really interested in finding out what is going on with your body or maybe someone you care about and just be open to this and, and look it up yourself see if it's true yeah it's i mean looking at it from and i just i you know just a different perspective what if you know it's like it's trying to disprove it well what if estrogen is a stress hormone what if it does this you know and, and then delve deeper into it because as well it's been told to us or it's been the understanding of mainstream for so long that this is it and then these new theories come along and instead of just going well now whatever you know like that's like well what if so let me look at it let me let me delve into it that's why i love what we're doing here today this is really great because as well if that is the case, and if so many women are doing all these things and all this other stuff, then it makes sense. It's like, oh, wait a minute, maybe that's the key. Maybe that's the thing. Yeah, there's that famous Einstein, there's that famous quote attributed to Einstein, but I don't know if it's him of like, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. Well, I think one of the interesting things that I see starting to come into collective consciousness, like even the mainstream very recently, maybe just in the last year, is this idea of, why is there an explosion of chronic disease? Like why have so many people got chronic diseases and at a younger and younger age? And they wanna blame various different factors and some of them we can't talk about on YouTube and there may be a you know, degree of validity to all of them. We talked about one in the last episode a lot, which is you know, that there was an explosion of unsaturated fat use, right? In, you know, starting in the 1980s, which correlated very nicely with that explosion of chronic diseases. I'm sure there were other factors involved as well. And you know, here we're talking about another one. There was an explosion of uh, estrogen use around uh, you know, the 1960s, which I think the next part of the quote will go into, which um, probably wasn't great. So yeah, let's go into it. <laughs> no, absolutely, yeah, I'll, I'll go into it. Um, so they sold DES, I'm gonna get this wrong, diethylstilbesterol, correct me if that's incorrect. I think that was a really good pronunciation. Woo! Uh, yeah, so, 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 <laughs> uh, so that's, yeah, synthetic estrogen. Uh, until in the 1950s, they were selling it with support from Harvard Medical School and the FDA and so on, selling it to prevent, to prevent miscarriages. Then with the development of birth control pills, it finally came out that DES was causing cancer and not at all preventing miscarriages, but tending to create miscarriages. So the whole medical establishment was lied to. Hundreds, thousands of lying publications in all the best medical journals. Same such things as estrogen prevents miscarriages, prevents cancer, prevents epilepsy. Everything that they claimed that estrogen did for benefit, it turned out estrogen was causing the disease rather than preventing it. That just breaks my heart. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, that is the main way that a whole generation of women were given constant supplemental estrogen is through the birth control pill. And the birth control pill was obviously empowering in some ways um, because it meant that women could choose when they wanted to be pregnant to a much greater degree than ever before. And I genuinely think that is a good thing. Um, you could say it's had some negative effects on society, but I think freedom and choice are you know fundamental to a good society. So I think... That was great in theory. The problem was that the mechanism that they used to make that happen was a thing that was 
perhaps, as we're learning here, a, uh, something that is a poison to the body, something that, you know, and, and the birth rates have been going down uh, for many generations. And it's a concern now among a lot of people. A lot of the turmoil that's going on geopolitically is all down to birth rate kind of panic where a lot of countries, their population, they're going to have more and more old people and less, less young people to replace them. And the whole economic system is dependent on that not happening. And it's a whole thing. And again, I'm, I'm not estrogen isn't the only thing. I think lack of thyroid is another thing we've really talked about. Too much seed oil is another thing we've really talked about. There's a bunch of other stuff as well. But it's, it's contributing to that issue. And as this particular thing estrogen directly as he just talked about um you know can reduce fertility increase miscarriages it's uh, it's significant very significant and then it's just that just also goes into feeding into what you thought was the truth and then having to go through the process like you were just saying earlier of going oh wait a minute they knew that, but yet they said that. And now look at the effects it's had on my body. Like, what do you, what does somebody do with that? Yeah. Um, well, there is uh, a good news, which is <laughs> the, the quotes that we're about to give. So, I'm not one. I'm not into one of those podcasts who talks a lot about the horrible things that different, you know, governments and companies have done to screw us over, and then just go, "Yeah, it's bad, isn't it?" Like at the end of it, you know, like that's not what we're here for. So if we're telling you something's terrible, you can bet that we're gonna, you know, offer, offer you something that will actually <laughs> help with that. So that brings us nicely to um, what Ray P. As I said, if if any hormone is the female hormone, and I don't think he would consider it either because he also recommended it in men, although he personally recommended men have much lower doses than women, which is different from what Dr. Michael Platt recommends. But anyway, progesterone is miraculous in general, according to Dr. P. and many other people. And again, countless studies. You know, the amount of studies that say that I don't know any vitamin is good for you or any herb or whatever. Uh, so much less than the studies that say that like thyroid is good for you or that progesterone is good for you or that estrogen is bad for you. And yet for some reason, which we could get conspiratorial about, uh, that's ignored. So yeah, let's talk about the miracle of progesterone. Absolutely. Um, he said, if you think of estrogen as doing everything that tends to excite the cell and move it to a lower non-oxidizing energy system, progesterone knocks out those effects of estrogen and gets the cell back on the oxidizing pathway which from his perspective is a good thing. Oxidizing, let's just say simply, it's uh, a way that your body is able to produce a lot more ATP, a lot more energy from a unit of glucose, which is food, rather than struggling to make energy. Perfect. He carries on to say each of the steroids has a range of properties and aldosterone has its estrogen resembling and anti-androgenic properties. Each one has a range. And it just turns out that progesterone will fill in for a deficiency of aldosterone or cortisol or androgen, but it will also protect against an excess toxic dose of those same things because it has a weak mineral corticoid effect that makes up for the absence of aldosterone as well as toxic excess. Yeah, so let me try and break that down yes, a little please. bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's saying, it, uh, I think it's a different quote. I don't know if we've got it down here. I don't think we do. That one of the f most amazing things about progesterone is that it has the ability both to substitute for the benefits of almost every other hormone. I'm pretty sure in a different quote, he said, the only two hormones that it can't make up for a lack of is testosterone and estrogen. But all the uh, sorry, out the steroid hormones. But all the others like uh, aldosterone, uh, cortisol, DHEA, um, uh, you know these super important hormones. It can, if 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 you literally remove them, like he gave an example of uh, uh, animals that have adrenal glands removed, they can still function just fine if you give them enough progesterone. It will make up for a lack of all of those things, which is pretty amazing. That is pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, and so, yeah. but he's saying not only can it make up for a lack of those things, but it can also actually help if you have far too much of those things. So it helps in both directions. Which is interesting because usually, or at least my understanding is that usually when you're taking something that the body makes, then the body makes less of it. So you're not saying, so progesterone doesn't do that. Uh, well, I think in the case of, say, cortisol, it would. So if you're producing a lot of cortisol, then you're adding progesterone in, your body will make less cortisol. Same with aldosterone. Aldosterone is one of the things that can lead to hyper uh, hypertension. 
um, it causes the, uh, the the blood vessels to contract. So it's one of the culprits with uh, high blood pressure, which of course is one of the main um, uh, things that can lead to cardiovascular disease. So um, yeah, it's uh, very, very uh, beneficial in that it can downregulate the production to some of those things if they're excessive. And yet on the other hand, yeah, I guess if you're, if you already have a very low level of something like aldosterone or cortisol or DHEA, then adding in the progesterone, it certainly won't reduce the production of those things. And it might actually increase it because it will bring the organism back to a state of health to the point where it can then start to make its own. Obviously not if the adrenal glands are removed, but if they're just you know not functioning <laughs> correctly. Yeah, that's what I was more referring to because it's like maybe, and I may be wrong, so please correct me. It's like if you if somebody is taking testosterone, then their body will make less of it or it's just that then... It, they will, they may have to continue uh, taking it or, or things like that. But what I'm hearing from you is yes. progesterone, as much as you take, it's not going to stop the body's ability to make it or enhance helping other hormones that uh, to get into balance. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be down regulating. And I think yeah. this is one of the reasons why it's allowed to be sold as a dietary supplement, at least in the US. Um, so the reason why testosterone is probably rightly, you know, strictly controlled and sold only you know uh, with a prescription from a doctor and similarly for thyroid in most countries is because with either of those things two things first of all if you take an overdose like if you take 10 times as much progesterone as you should it's not a good idea but you won't have to be rushed to the emergency room if you take 10 times as much testosterone or or thyroid as you should you probably do have to go and see a medical professional right like it's a real issue second of all yeah with the progesterone now there is a bit of a thing where the liver gets more efficient at clearing the progesterone but there's absolutely not a thing where your body will stop making its own progesterone which does happen with testosterone where the te the other testicles shrink when people take uh, trt testosterone replacement and basically they stop making their own testosterone that happens with uh, thyroid as well to some degree although ray pete was of the opinion that the thyroid can bounce back very quickly he, his uh, experience was that within a few days it can go right back to making as much as it was before i think most medical doctors would say it's probably take a few months not a few days but in either case it's something that can be recovered from but yeah there's that down regulation which doesn't happen with progesterone anywhere near as much or at all depending on the situation Perfect. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. He goes on to say, and the same thing, testosterone has progesterone sustaining pregnancy sustaining effects if you give it to a pregnant animal, but it's not nearly as effective at that purpose as progesterone. And the estrogen is the thing that's, that it's strictly antagonistic to. It will have some of the anti-inflammatory properties of cortisol, as well as being a major protector against excess cortisol poisoning. And it does a lot of those things on the enzyme level as well as the so-called receptor level. When you look at a list of its actions, coordinated effects on both receptors of all sorts and enzyme activation changes, you would think it was a magical invention. It's so extremely complex, but organized. And so remember, this was not something, unlike some of the other theories that we'll put in there, this was not something that Dr. Pete had a casual interest in over the course of maybe years. This is some, This was really his life work. You know, he's a professor that taught a lot of top universities and studying progesterone and teaching about progesterone is really one of his things. And he considered it a, you know, literally a magic wand almost for health, just an incredible thing for restoring health, even in people who are very sick. Um, if given, you know, insufficient quantities because of these effects of being able to recover from the damage of things like estrogen and cortisol, which each of them, you know, in excess can kill you like they're that bad. I mean, it really is coming across as it's a pretty perfect thing that we should all really have in quite good quantity. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, the more we're looking at it, the more I'm hearing about it, it sounds like yeah, I love what he said. It's so extremely complex, but organized and does so many incredible things. I think we had a quote in the previous uh, quotes episode where he basically stated that pregnenolone, which is the steroid precursor to all the other ones, but often is the precursor to progesterone and progesterone were like able to heal most every, everything if given insufficient quantities and had been suppressed by the pharmaceutical industry for that reason. I'm not saying that, of course. Uh, but that is exactly what he said. I thought I'd just repeat that, paraphrase that quote again. 
um, and it's something that's worth considering. Now, of course, with progesterone, if you look it up, you'll see that it's bad for you, generally, if you Google it. And so one of the reasons for that is, of course, bias. But another one is that the type of progesterone that they're talking about is not the type that we're talking about. So the type of progesterone we're talking about is bioidentical progesterone, which is either the stuff that your body creates or something that's exactly the same as your body creates. The type of progesterone that they sometimes give women, so some birth control pills contain only synthetic estrogen, but some birth control pills contain synthetic estrogen and synthetic progesterone. That synthetic progesterone is actually really bad news and has a lot of the opposite effects of all the stuff we've just been saying about progesterone. And so often when you look up, you know, progesterone for this, progesterone for that, it will say it's bad for you. But if you look carefully, they're usually not referring to the bioidentical ones. And what's the, um, how, how is, how is bioidentical progesterone made? Uh, from yam. Okay. Root, You're right. Root, okay. root vegetable. Yeah. It's just containing the root vegetable. So it's a very cheap, quick, easy, and of course, non-patentable which is the real issue uh, thing that anyone can anyone can make. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, he carries on in this this one here. Catherine Daltron in the 40s and 50s was treating premenstrual syndrome patients and menopause patients, but she had lots of patients suffering from poor nutrition who also had TMS problems. And over the years, she was giving them progesterone injections. And after several years of having treated them just for their current symptoms, someone said, it's interesting that your patient's babies are so superior intellectually. And Dalton said that that seems unlikely because their women with PMS are likely to have pregnancy problems, premature deliveries, and stressed pregnancies. And it's known that their babies average a few points below normal IQs. And so she doubled doubted that person was right in saying that their babies were superior. So she studied it and found that all of the progesterone babies were academically superior, just like the chickens that had had better brains for being exposed to the protective metabolic regulator. And I think she said that they were typically around 130 IQs instead of 96 IQs as their older siblings untreated with progesterone. So it was about a 34 point improvement in IQ just for that one addition. She didn't pay attention to their thyroid or protein intake or salt intake or any of the other factors so this is mind-blowing if true and again as i said this is not an opinion this is not channeled from atlantis this is science um and so the science is that yeah this is what was discovered now okay 34 points of iq let me put that into comparison that's called more than two standard deviations so um, 30 points IQ increase can take you from someone who is so mentally disabled they're unable to look after themselves without full-time care to someone who is completely average intelligence. Or 30 point IQ intake could take you from someone who is completely average intelligence to an actual genius. That's the difference that it makes. It's an extraordinary increase of IQ. And as he says, that's without sorting all the other problems that many of those women probably had. Malnutrition, lack of thyroid hormone. Um, that was just one variable. So the fact that that variable has such a huge effect. IQ is an extremely controversial thing to talk about at all. So I will not go into it too much. But I'll just point out a couple of facts, which is... So first of all, IQ is the number one predictor of success in life when we're talking about finances and career. The, there's this general idea that your success is probably mainly based on, you know, whether you had rich parents, whether you had successful parents, what school you go to. And there's a lot of evidence that makes that seem to be true. But actually, if you look into the data, if you had the choice between being born into a very privileged upbringing with, you know, rich, successful parents, sending you to a private school, sending you to Eton or Harvard or whatever, and having an average IQ or having like 130 IQ and being born into a completely normal, you know, working class household with normal parents who couldn't afford to send you to fancy school. You just went to a normal state school and all the rest of it. You are actually statistically more likely to be successful with 130 IQ than with all the privileges of wealth and status and, and social circle and all the rest of it. IQ is the biggest predictor of a success. It's actually also one of the biggest predictors of success when it comes to health. It's one of the best predictors of longevity. So 
you know, whenever you say this to people, they say, well, I know really smart people who are really stupid. And I'd say, yes, absolutely true. Me too. <laughs> I used to hang around with a lot of them. Um, and they were, you know, dead broke, criminals, drug addicts, and they were really, really smart IQ people. So, uh, and, you know, arguably could say I was one of them in my early 20s. So uh, maybe not really smart, but the, the rest <laughs> of those descriptions. So um, absolutely. High IQ does not guarantee making wise decisions. It does not equal success. It does not equal health. It does not equal longevity necessarily. However, low IQ makes it very, very, very difficult to be highly successful. And low IQ makes it very, very difficult to actually have a very long lived life as well. We're gonna take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. What aspect or mechanism that progesterone is creating in the environment do you think is allowing for that? I don't understand this as much as Dr. Pete does. So I definitely recommend people to look into his work of it to understand it better. But my understanding is, so we think of progesterone as a sex hormone because it's uh, you know primarily produced in that area. But one of the areas that has the biggest impacts on that Dr. Pete talks about a lot is actually the brain. So there's something about how it stimulates, uh, you know, the production of um, uh, brain uh, neuron growth. But I think the main way that it does it is because it's protective. It's protective from inflammation. It's protective from excess estrogen. It's protective from too much cortisol. It's protective from, uh, you know, um, a lack of blood flow caused by too much aldosterone. It's protective of all the things that might otherwise retard the optimal growth of the brain so i think it's less that it's like super brain juice and it's more that it's like super brain protector shield that's probably more the way of looking at it that we would all be geniuses if only you know we weren't being uh, ravaged by uh, too much inflammation lack of nutrition too much toxicity maybe lack of oxygen lack of this lack of that and so progesterone just helps to protect from all of those negative circumstances to a large degree. The exact mechanism that comes to that, Chrissy, if you're about to ask me that. <laughs> no. We've we've already read out a few of them, right? But it, it gets really deep and really complicated. And Dr. P is someone who will explain it in great detail. You know, he's got a wealth of articles on his uh, uh, f you know, website, which someone else is still keeping going. And, um, you know, you can really get into it very deeply. And he gives huge amounts, again, of scientific references for all these points he's making. He doesn't expect you to take his word for it. That's great. Now, this has been a fantastic section. I know for the things that we've been doing to prepare for um, the, the Dr. Michael Platt episode, the things that you've been sharing with me to prepare for this episode, I've been finding this absolutely fascinating and changes that I've been implementing, you know, are very, very interesting. It's really shifted a way I think about um, the hormones and, and, and things like that. So I do thank you for that, <laughs> for sure. My pleasure. And I'll say, you know, like I heard about thyroid before Dr. Pete, although everything that he says, you know, uh, agrees with it. Uh, but I probably really got into progesterone first by listening to Dr. Pete. And those two things together, I do believe has the miraculous healing effect that he talks about, like life transforming effect. Um, does it happen overnight? Again, depends how much of a mess you are to start with. But um, 
I think it's, uh, you know, 100% valid for my own personal experience. I'll just share that. Uh, did you mean lit by listening to Dr. Platt? You got into progesterone first? Uh, no, Dr. P. No, Dr. P. Okay, yeah, sorry. Because yeah, Dr. Platt was my first introduction to progesterone. Dr. Platt told me how much it's possible to take. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I would not have been open to it even being a good thing without having read a lot of Dr. Pete's work first. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, that's our section on our estrogen and our progesterone. So we are now going to move into our next uh, quote that was posted. So the next ones up are CO2 is more important than oxygen and nitric oxide is an unhealthy stress chemical. So these concepts are so fundamentally opposite to what we're taught, especially the first one, right? If you ask people what is the most important nutrient and then they kind of get their head around it, they probably go, Oh, it's oxygen, right? Number one thing is oxygen because you only go a few minutes without breathing. Number two is water because you can only go a few days without water and then all the rest is a lot longer, right? So oxygen seems like the most important nutrient. Um, so the idea of carbon dioxide being more important than oxygen is kind of saying it's the most important nutrient of all. Um, some people actually class it as a hormone. I don't know if Dr. Pete does. Uh, I think that's uh, you know a valid definition of uh, carbon dioxide or CO2. CO2 is actually one of the most beneficial things in the body. And it's quite hilarious that, you know, there's this effort to demonize it as a bad thing in the environment, because not only is it one of the most essential things in the human body, it's also the most essential thing, arguably, well, along with sunlight and water for helping plants grow, right? And as carbon dioxide increases in the ap atmosphere, plants grow more and more. And as CO2 increases in the human body, it has lots of beneficial effects as well, which we'll talk about. So how is it beneficial? Let's start with like my understanding before I came across Dr. Pete, and then we'll add Dr. Pete's understanding. So I first came across this concept from uh, Dr. Buteyko. Dr. Buteyko is uh, was a Russian scientist, and he observed that the more that people had, the higher, he was a pulmonary um, uh, scientist. He would... Uh, uh, check people's breathing basically in a medical context and he would see the extre two extremes he would work with like astronauts and athletes who are like the very highest level of pulmonary function and then he'd also work with people who were you know dying of pulmonary disease of various kinds and you know struggling to breathe and he observed a very interesting correlation which is that the more that people breathed the sicker they got up until and including the point that they stopped breathing altogether. And the less that they breathed, the healthier that they were. Can you, does that mean like in the more breaths during like the minute that they're taking to breathe or what's the distinction, uh, the definition of that? Literally filling up a bag, how much of a bag you would fill up with how much you're exhaling. Cause obviously if you're- Right, right, the volume. volume. Yeah, absolutely volume, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think, in fact, uh, I might have misremembered this. I didn't look it up for years, but I think it's something like maybe six liters you'd consider really great. And then like 12 was more common when people are unhealthy. But the one thing I, th that I do remember is, so this is what he observed. So therefore he would see that the more that people were able to hold their breath, the healthier that they were. And so people who were on the brink of dying and it wasn't just a pulmonary disease, it could be any disease. They would be able to hold their breath for a few seconds without desperately gasping. People who are like, peak you know level of uh, uh strength and vitality they could hold their breath for maybe easily 60 seconds without effort and so that he ended up calling the control pause uh basically what the way that you measure your own control pause is you take a little breath in you breathe out but don't push any air out just let your lungs relax so half a breath out and then you basically just hold your breath and you get a stopwatch and you see how many seconds you can hold it before you feel any kind of significant desire to breathe. And so he had a very really simple chart for it. He said, if you're, if the amount of time you can hold it easily is between zero and 10 seconds, you're probably already sick. If it's between 10 and 20 seconds, you're probably on the verge of getting sick. Like you, you probably get sick frequently or, you know, it doesn't take much. If it's between 20 and 40 seconds, then you're probably, you know, averagely healthy, like okay, but can be taken down without too much trouble. If you're between 40 and 60, you're pretty strong. And from his perspective, you're, if you're above 60 seconds, if you could genuinely hold your breath with no effort for more than 60 seconds in a relaxed way, then you'd be like superhuman from his point of view. Um, so that was his experience. 
there's a whole system behind it called the Buteco method that people still do and teach to this day. It has not caught on massively, despite being very effective for a lot of things. The usually the main thing it's used for is asthma. It's very effective for that, but it's actually very effective for a whole range of different health issues. Uh, but it, his system, not Dr. Pete's, but his system, Dr. Buteco, is required like practicing holding your breath for a long time, which is actually very, very difficult. And so anything that requires uh, an extensive amount of effort, discipline, exertion, and overcoming resistance tends to not <laughs> get a lot of mass appeal, at least unless there's kind of a status <laughs> thing, right? I guess people will love to like do intensive exercise, but then often it's a lot of showing off. And, you know, if you say, oh, I held my breath for 60 seconds today, no one's going to go, oh, well done. So there's not really any status around it. And uh, it's very difficult. So it's never really caught on. But anyway, what's the science behind it? And how does it relate to Dr. Pete? So Chrissy, you'll probably know the answer to this as a, uh, you know, based on context, but like, if you hold your breath, what is the thing that tells you I need to breathe now? What is the mechanism? Oh, if, I mean, I don't really, for me, it's the, it's the pressure of the buildup of, of the, yeah, the buildup of the carbon dioxide in the body that's Correct. building up that tells me I need to breathe. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. You know the answer. <laughs> uh, most people though think that it's lack of oxygen, right? If I hold my breath for too long, I need to breathe. Why? Because I'm running out of oxygen. So the key thing to understand is this thing called uh, the, the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R, that was invented in 1904. And what Dr. Bohr discovered is that in order for oxygen to get from the blood, red blood cells, which, so the oxygen goes into your lungs, for the lungs, it goes into the red blood cells, the red blood cells through the whole cardiovascular system, transport the oxygen throughout the body, but then to get it from those red blood cells into every other cell, it requires carbon dioxide. And so if you have, if you do not have sufficient carbon dioxide to go from the red blood cells into every other cell, that means that that cell has to start making do without carbon dioxide, sorry, without oxygen or with less oxygen. And so it can do that. It can do anaerobic respiration. It can do anaerobic energy creation through various different mechanisms, but none of them are as energy efficient and none of them are as, uh, you know, involve the fastest, strongest, highest level of metabolism, which is why Dr. Pete was fundamentally against all of them because optimizing metabolism was really, I would say the centerpiece of his whole philosophy. So now here's the thing, the higher stress chemicals, the more that you have an intolerance to carbon dioxide, the more that you feel that the same level of carbon dioxide is intolerable to you and you have to breathe more. And people get into a kind of loop with this and at the extreme, this is called hyperventilating. So hyperventilating people, <laughs> right? Because they're just trying to get out as much CO2 as possible. Now, when someone is hyperventilating, what's the usual advice they give you? Get a paper bag, right? And blow into that. Why? Because then you're not losing the carbon dioxide. You keep breathing it back in again because you're breathing into a bag. So it's kind of trying to break that cycle. Now, other than this effect of being crucial from tra to transporting oxygen from the, um, from the red blood cells into every other cell, the other thing that's so important about carbon dioxide is, is the number one way that your body relaxes the whole cardiovascular system. So dilates and opens your arteries, your capillaries, your blood vessels, and all the rest of it. So what you're saying, you're saying CO2 is what dilates the capillaries and not, it's not, not that, because I always thought it was nitric oxide. So you're saying it's CO2? It's definitely CO2. Uh, this is one of the craziest things about science. It's it's up there. Uh, to me, it's, it's just as crazy as a lot of the other things we've talked about, like almost everyone starving for fire aid or people poisoning themselves of estrogen, um, is believing that CO2 is a bad thing when in fact it is you know, one of the number one things that is beneficial for your body. So that's why I added the other quote about nitric oxide being bad for you. Dr. Pete firmly believed that nitric oxide is a stress gas. It is a gas that, it is a secondary backup system 
from Dr. Pete's point of view, which is used in certain circumstances, which I'll talk about in a second, but generally you should have sufficient carbon dioxide to keep all of those arteries and blood vessels and all the rest open. And the nitric oxide, from his point of view, and I agree with this, is a emergency backup way of opening those blood vessels to keep you alive. But it's not the primary way that that should be going on. Now, what I didn't learn from Dr. Buteteko, but which I learned from Dr. Pete, is exactly why and how CO2 is so beneficial. Why Dr. Buteko was right that those people who could barely hold their breath for a few seconds were probably you know very ill versus the people who could hold it for a long long time were probably very strong and resilient and not ill is because carbon dioxide is mainly created when your body is doing when your body is creating energy when your body is creating ATP in the optimal way so when your body is creating ATP using the Krebs cycle and it's uh, going through the electron transport chain. It's doing the whole thing that means you get, um, uh, I think it's almost 30 units of ATP from, from two units of glucose, so the abundance of ATP. When it's doing it that way, the two byproducts are water and carbon dioxide. Now, from a normal medical perspective, it's a waste byproduct but the interesting thing that dr pete said and again this is not a theory there's abundance of science behind this is that the higher that co2 remains the more that the body stays in that high metabolism efficient optimal energy producing state whereas the more that you're depleted of co2 the more it goes into its backup state and based on what i said earlier about Dr. Buteyko, the reason for this should be obvious if you're joining the dots, because all of those backup, less efficient energy producing systems tend to be anaerobic or they're less aerobic, so meaning less oxygen. So basically, that CO2 that you're creating is not a waste product, although you do need to blow off the excess, obviously, but it's not a waste product because you need a certain amount to get the oxygen back into the cells for the next round of energy production. And if you keep blowing off that CO2 excessively because your stress chemicals are too high, which means that you're overbreathing or hyperventilating, then you don't have enough CO2 transporting enough oxygen into the cells. Your cells are going to be creating energy for an inefficient mechanism. They're going to produce less CO2 as a byproduct, and you're stuck in this vicious circle. And when there's less CO2 floating around, then you're going to be in a state of hypertension or closer to it. If all other things being equal, I mean, there are adrenal issues and stuff that can mean you've got all that bad stuff going on. You still are not having high blood pressure, but generally it leads to high blood pressure. And then the body has nitric oxide as an emergency backup system to deal with that. But nitric oxide has its own issues. So I think at that point, let's go to what Dr. Pete said about CO2. Absolutely says the basic control of blood flow in the brain is the result of the relaxation of the wall of blood vessels in the presence of carbon dioxide which is produced in proportion to the rate at which oxygen and glucose are being metabolically combined by active cells in the inability of cells to produce co2 at a normal rate nitric oxide synthesis in blood vessels can cause them to dilate the mechanism of relaxation by nitric oxide is very different however involving the inhibition of mitochondrial energy production situations that favor the production and retention of larger amounts of carbon dioxide in the tissues are likely to reduce the basic tone of the parasympathetic nervous system and there's less need for additional vasodilation okay so i kind of already said all that but he said it in the proper sciencey way <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at a couple of bits of that so the mechanism of relaxation by nitric oxide is very different involving the inhibition of mitochondrial energy production and again he gives a you know scientific reference in that quote um so meaning if you're using co2 that helps with mitochondrial energy production but if you're using nitric oxide it actually slows down mitochondrial energy production so it actually makes it worse um, the other thing he said is that large amounts of carbon dioxide in this tissues are likely to reduce the basic tone of the parasympathetic nervous system so basically um if you have enough carbon dioxide you stay relaxed 
that's the other uh, uh, part of it. And so this, in my view, is one of the reasons that exercise is often, but not always, as we'll talk about next, healthy for people. So the main way that we produce carbon dioxide uh, more than usual well there's two ways we can kind of build up carbon dioxide in the system one is to hold our breath uh most people don't do that although there is a theory that people are actually doing that unconsciously and that that's the real cause of sleep apnea the body is holding the breath not because it's trying to kill you but because it's trying to build up carbon dioxide because it's getting so low that it's actually an issue um so that's a theory but the other main way that we build up carbon dioxide is exercise that's why when you're running or whatever you're doing, you breathe more, right? You may be out of breath, you may be puffing and panting and all the rest of it. If you're pushing yourself hard, that's simply a response to the carbon dioxide, right? There's nothing else that you're doing there other than just getting rid of what feels like an excess of carbon dioxide. Very good. Yeah, that's whew, lots. So he carries on to say nitric oxide is increasingly seen as an important factor in nerve degeneration. Nitric oxide activates processes that can lead to cell death. Inhibition on the production of nitric oxide protects against various kinds of dementia. Brain trauma causes large increase in nitric oxide formation and blocking its synthesis improves recovery. Yeah. And so every statement you made there, obviously, we're not going to read it out, but there's studies behind it right so all of these bad things that excess nitric oxide is actually doing and so how have we come to this idea that you just said chrissy that nitric oxide is the thing that dilates the blood vessels well as i said technically it's true it does it's just that it does it in a bad way so where's this come from it came from the discovery of viagra in the 80s um which has been used you know later also for cardiovascular health by a lot of people including even some biohackers who really should know better but they don't understand it's actually the uh, the backup system. So whereas carbon dioxide has this anti-inflammatory ox uh, metabolism boosting energy producing benefit, nitric oxide is the opposite. However, um, nitric oxide is often related to being in this excite excitatory state, right? And so one area where nitric oxide absolutely is required is for mental interaction. So, you know, uh, that's, I've got, uh, you know, a herbal product for that, and I stand by that. For that very specific purpose, nitric oxide is necessary and is effective. However, should men be walking around with one of those 24 hours a day? Absolutely not. So this is a thing where a little bit of poison is no big deal, right? A little bit of nitric oxide, whatever it is, an hour a day or however much you're erect, that's absolutely fine. Your body can deal with that. But having that be the only thing that stops you being hypertensive 24 hours a day, that's not a good thing. So that's the distinction. And so you could even make the argument of the Viagra. There's nothing wrong with that. It lasts for a few hours. Use it every now and then. That's okay. It's not the end of the world. But when people are kind of trying to constantly boost nitric oxide to open the blood vessels, to me, that seems like a, a, a really bad idea when you look into the actual science behind it. Um, Dr. Pete goes on to say, organophosphates increase nitric oxide formation and the productive anticholinergenic drugs such as atropine reduce it. Stress, including fear and isolation, can activate the formation of nitric oxide and various mediators of inflammation also activate it. The nitric oxide in a person's exhaled breath can be used to diagnose some diseases, and it probably reflects the level of their emotional well-being. So whereas the level of CO2 is a way of diagnosing health from this perspective, it being higher being good because it means you must be able to retain most of it rather than you know, blowing out excessively in a, um, in a hyperventilating way. So nitric oxide is actually literally the opposite. So if this is the case, why do people favor nitric oxide other than maybe brainwashing by the uh, pharmaceutical industries? I think it's actually for the reason that it said. So if I just go back to it, stress, including fear, can activate the formation of nitric oxide. So you've got to remember, and we talked about this a lot in other episodes on stress, people like the feeling of stress often when the alternative is a feeling of depression and deflation and, and being a low in energy, right? So just a reminder, there's three kind of basic modalities of the nervous system. One is a dorsal vagal mode where we feel shut down. The other is a sympathetic mode where we feel 
overstimulated. And the third is a ventral vagal mode where we feel relaxed yet energized. So a lot of people, a lot of the time are in a shutdown state or probably not in a shutdown state, but resisting a shutdown state, right? Like, um, you know, I hear this a lot in people and they're like, oh, I can't stop because if I do, I'll collapse. You know, I'll fall asleep. Like, I've got to keep going. I've got to keep going. I've got to keep going. So anyone who has that attitude, I've got to have another coffee. I've got to do this, got to do this. Like, I can't stop because if I do, I'll collapse, which is a lot of people. That is that attitude of I need to fight that dorsal vagal state off. And so when that's your mode of being, which is very common, and again, I'm not making anyone wrong for this because often this starts because of the stuff we've talked about, lack of thyroid hormone, excess of estrogen, lack of progesterone, lack of testosterone, um, excess of inflammation, excess of seed oils, et cetera, et cetera, and many other things, all of that stuff. But once you're in that state, stress feels good because the alternative is collapse or, or you know, uh, uh, depression or whatever you want to call it, which feels bad. So I think that's why people like nitric oxide. But the thing that actually will get you out of that vicious circle of going between collapse and overstimulation, a piece of it actually is carbon dioxide. And so learning to tolerate carbon dioxide is good. Dr. Pete, as far as I'm aware, did not uh, talk about and recommend Buteco breathing practices. I don't know why I haven't seen him comment on it, but if I had to guess, I would guess this because the main mechanism that um, Buteco breathing practices use to help you to tolerate more CO2, which is a good thing, but the mechanism they use is to get you to hold your breath for a really, really, really long time until you absolutely feel like you can't anymore, which they call the maximum pause as opposed to the control pause. And often you're holding your breath for like several minutes, many minutes. I got to the point where I could hold my breath for three minutes from cold without any preparation. Um, but I'll tell you what that does when you hold your breath for such a long time, it triggers stress chemicals. And Dr. Pete was not keen on that. So his method of boosting carbon dioxide was different. He would encourage people not to over breathe, certainly, but he was not necessarily encouraging people to hold their breath for a very long time. He encouraged them to obviously get into this high metabolism state where you are producing ATP in optimal way because that will naturally raise carbon dioxide anyway. And he also actually experimented with increasing CO2 in the environment um, and potentially even bathing in it. So doing like a, um, I don't actually know if he did this, but I know one of his biggest followers like has a whole book on bath bombs and it's basically adding sodium bicarbonate and an acid like citric acid to a bath. And then when you do that, it creates, there's loads of CO2 in the atmosphere. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere will go like 10 times. But actually, there's all the CO2 bubbles in the bath itself. And it doesn't have to be a whole bath. If you don't have a bath, you can just do a foot bath. It's still good. And these little two, CO2 bubbles, just like if you drink sparkling water, they'll, um, you know, uh, um, what's the word? Collect on the surface of your skin. And then they'll be absorbed transdermally through your skin straight into circulation. So if you, if you want to do it in a relaxed way, you know, warm bath, you know, the candles, music, whatever, right? You can be super, super relaxed and then still really saturate your body in CO2. And I'm actually a big fan of that. I really like doing it. I know we still have our list, but I, and maybe this might be for another time because Wim Hof is big out there in breath and holding breath and things like that. Is that similar to Pateco? Is it different? Um, where does it fall on those lines? Yeah, it's a good question. So Wim Hof is absolutely not similar to Pateco. Like any Pateco practitioner would say it's not because Wim Hof tells you to do something that all Pateco people tell you to never do, which is hyperventilate. But I think in, there is genius to Wim Hof's breathing because what he's really encouraging you to do is to go between the extremes of hyperventilating, so blowing out all the CO2, and then holding your breath and building up the CO2. And if you notice with a Wim Hof breathing pattern, it always ends with holding the breath. So it's CO2 right down, CO2 right up, CO2 right down, CO2 right up, CO2 right down, CO2 right up. That's what's going on. Now, another thing that's going on with that, which he talks about a lot and the scientists who work with him, is that is spiking the hell out of the stress chemicals. The yeah. cortisol, yeah, the adrenaline, yeah. the noradrenaline. Is that a good thing overall? I don't think that that settled in either direction, although, of course, adherents of either side would say that it is. But I think it ultimately depends on what you want to do with your life. I think if you want to do the kind of superhuman stuff that, you know, um, Wim Hof has done, it proven in the laboratory condition, but also, you know, many other 
mystics and monks and all the rest of it throughout the ages have been reported to do. If you want to do that supernatural stuff, you do have to be very, very good at controlling your body's internal processes that are normally automatic. And one of those things would be to manipulate stress chemicals, sometimes to be extremely high. It's not necessarily bad for you to do what he does because the theory behind it is that you're yes you are skyrocketing the stress chemicals but then they can go back down again and they can actually you know find an equ equilibrium it depends what you have to do you know let's i would say the wim hof method of uh i noticed it tends to be more attractive to men than women although there's plenty of women involved but still most kind of health groups, there's more women than men. In the Wim Hof health groups, there tends to be more men than women. And I don't think that's an accident. I think it's because, you know, one of the things that people say when they do Wim Hof breathing is something similar that people say when they do fighting, which is like, it makes it everything else seems quite easy to deal with in comparison. It's like you're, you're toning that sympathetic response to the point where, like, you're able to deal with even highly stressful situations very well. So if you're in a context of I need to climb a mountain like Mount Everest or in the context of I need to be in battle, I need to risk my life, I think those kind of practices are very beneficial because they make you very strong and resilient and hardy because you're the master of your own stress chemicals. However, what if it's peacetime? What if you don't want to climb up Mount Everest in your shorts? What if there are no battles? What if you just want to live long and be happy and relaxed and peaceful and joyful and play with your kids? And, you know, not all of us have that luxury, but let's say you are in an environment where you have that luxury. Then it could be argued that it's not beneficial to do these things to spike your stress chemicals because they're just going to prematurely age you still, potentially. And if nothing else, they're going to stop you from having that optimal energy production. I've had rumors, which I won't repeat here, but I don't know if they're true, but that Wim Hof struggled with his own issues, despite, you know, being a master in, in some ways that, you know, he's extremely impressive to everyone, definitely including me. Um, so it's a choice. You know, do you want to master your stress chemicals or do you want to stop living in a stress state? Some will say it's a false choice. No, by they would say by Wim Hof method, you master your stress chemicals, which will stop you being a stress state. But I remember one of the scientists um, in the documentary, you know, who's on his side, but talking about him, he said, you know, not only was his cortisol very high and his noradrenaline very high after he did his breathing practice, it was higher even when he just walked into the room, even before all that. Like, it just seemed to be high in general. And is that a good thing? Maybe. I think, you know, there is a certain point, like when you can control your own physiology and you can literally, you know, change your heart rate at will, change your CO2 concentration at will, change your adrenaline at will, change your level of lactic acid at will, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then it's just a choice what you do with it. So I wouldn't want to judge Wim Hof or anyone with that level of self-mastery. But I'll say for the average person who doesn't want to become superhuman it and who doesn't maybe want to harden themselves and strengthen themselves to you know, be able to thrive even in extreme duress, um, it might be better to just focus on optimizing your body's energy production rather than like making yourself super, super resilient to stress. Because by making yourself resilient to stress, you're also potentially filling your body's stress and prematurely aging yourself. We don't know that for sure. Wim Hof is, you know, still youngish. He's certainly not 80 or something, right? So he's not yet reached the average age that people die. So we don't know for sure. Maybe he'll live to be 150 and we're all completely wrong about this. I guess we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> no, thanks for that digression. Thank you for that. So we've got another one lined up. And this one I'm very, very interested in because it's, um, yeah, a little, a little out there, a little controversial. So Dr. P, one of the tweets was, most forms of cardio and endurance training are unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. So this is, one of his, <laughs> <laughs> this is one of his most controversial um, statements. And I would say it's related to what we we're just talking about in terms of Wim Hof a little bit, which is that when you, with, I think, whether Wim Hof method is a good idea, one of the other reasons why it might be a good idea or a bad idea is what state you're in when you start. And so if you're in a very strong, healthy state 
and you're you know you have a good fast metabolism i think all the wim hof practices are a better idea than they would be otherwise including you know the extreme cold as well like what i discovered is you have to have a good metabolism for cold exposure to be a good idea if your thyroid is really underactive and your metabolism is low and your core temperature is low you will really struggle with cold exposure and you'll also feel worse. And I think to some degree that's true of the breathing. I've never heard of that before. So that's really interesting. So somebody that's really working on their thyroid should potentially not use that as, you know, the cold using cold, because you think that that's supposed to be something that's super healthy for you. But I guess there's a, you know, a maybe not in certain instances. It's definitely not always healthy, healthy to you. And I think even Wim Hof's method, they agree with that. They say, if you're ill, don't do it right? Why don't, why not do it if you're ill, if it's so healthy? Well, because you're already run down, right? Well, if your thyroid hormone is, uh, uh, if your thyroid gland is down, then you're always a bit run down. You're always on the brink of having some chronic issue when your thyroid hormone is sufficiently low. So uh, yeah, Dr. Pete, I don't think I've got the quote in uh, the sheet I prepared for you, but Dr. Pete certainly was of the mind of that, that cold exposure can be a good thing if your metabolism is fast enough to recover but it's definitely not a good thing if you're not because the other way that you can recover from that extreme cold if not through a healthy metabolism is of course through stress chemicals again but there is a challenge with raising those stress chemicals which we just talked about so yeah i won't go you know too much further into that let's talk about exercise um so again this doesn't say all exercise i think he was actually a fan of uh, a moderate amount of resistance training and he was certainly a fan of like more casual exercise like walking and you know stuff like that but it was the you know uh, endurance training especially running a marathon stuff like that which he considered to not be healthy in most cases um so in fact i've got quite a little quote Let's just get into that, Chrissy, to explain that. I won't speak for him in this case. Incidental stresses such as strenuous exercise combined with fasting, e.g. running or working or working out before bre eating breakfast, not only directly trigger the production of lactate and ammonia, they, all, they also are likely to increase the absorption of bacterial endotoxin from the intestine. Endotoxin is a ubiquitous and chronic stressor. It increases lactate and nitric oxide, poisoning mitochondrial respiration, precipitating the secretion of the adaptive stress hormones, which don't always fully repair the cellular damage. I mean, like, it's bit, I always hear people saying, yes, I, I do my workout before I have have my breakfast so then maybe they're you know that like that's massive and i've done that for years and years so it's like so reading this it's like that's not a good idea yeah it's such a bad idea i, I mean i follow a lot of health people on different platforms and I'll t who it's definitely not a good idea for them and i've heard it from them is women generally like it's a lot worse of an idea for women than men is what I generally hear. I think there's a few reasons for that. I think the tendency for high estrogen is one of them. The tendency to be more likely to suffer from hypothyroid is another one. Um, we really talked a lot about this in the episode on insulin resistance as to you know whether intermittent fasting is a good idea. But again, if here's the thing to understand. When Dr. Pete says all of those things that increases the uh, absorption of endotoxin into the bloodstream, which, that stresses the body, that increases lactate, that increases nitric oxide, that it reduces mitochondrial respiration, which poisons any production, where that it increases the um, excretion of stress hormones, that it doesn't allow you to repair cellular damage. Every single thing there will be based on facts and evidence. There'll be studies to support it. The most you can say with Dr. Pete is not that he's making it up, but that he's missing something, right? <laughs> So there may be a bunch of other studies that say, ah, but they also da da da, and therefore it's actually good. But all of those things are true, <laughs> if that makes sense. And so we just have to, uh, uh, you know, weigh that up. So I think what it probably was good that we started talking about the cold uh, with this sex segment rather than the previous segment where we're talking about breathing, because to me, exercise is another example of that. I think Dr. Pete is correct. Um, and so there's this concept of, but there's this concept of hormesis. So hormesis is a stressor that is ultimately beneficial. You can see that in a plant, you know, that um, I remember uh, there was this thing with plants where they tried, they, they did this uh, study and they tried to create the ideal conditions for them. And it was like the perfect light, the perfect amount of CO2, the perfect amount of oxygen, perfect amount of water, perfect amount of nutrients. And then the plants ended up growing 
really weak and collapsing and weren't able to handle their own crops basically the crop was a complete failure and they realized that the reason was because they never had any wind they never had any wind to buffer them which would make the you know the this the infrastructure like the stems and st that fibrous enough to hold them up you know despite then having the fruits and so it's the similar concepts like things like cold exposure things like extreme breathing practices and even things like endurance exercise they are stressors like the wind so the question is there's a certain amount of wind that will just destroy a plant and there's a certain amount of lack of wind that will weaken a plant and so it's the right level of stressor given the context some plants are able to handle the stressors a lot more than others the more that they have all the things they need like light and, ox and oxygen and co2 and nitrogen and phosphorus and blah 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 the more they have all that stuff they need the more they'll be able to handle the stresses without it actually being a negative factor that you know i mean i'm sure you've seen when you blow in a fan on a plant too much and it starts to dry out and it's, it's actually damaging it right so it's the right balance always and so i think all these things do happen with exercises i say dr pete doesn't make any of this stuff up the question is are you able to handle it is it you know the, the whole nietzsche quote of whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger i remember someone tried to tell me that in my 20s and I was a typical smart aleck and I said what about stroke <laughs> 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 and they said uh, I think it would I remember their reply was also clever they said I think it would behoove you to act as if it's true even if it's not actually true um, <laughs> and <laughs> there's a certain wisdom to that so it's tricky right and so this so how would Dr. Pete um, handle this distinction of how much is too much I won't speak for him but I'll say what I would imagine I think you would um, calibrate that by the effect on your metabolism. So, for instance, with the cold water, if a couple of hours later your metabolism is high again with all the you know signs that you use for that that we talked about in the last episode, then doing that periodically may well be good. It may well be hormesis. It's strengthening you. Same with exercise. So I think with exercise, and I think this reflects what Dr. Pete said as well, the key thing is how you feel afterwards, like, and not immediately afterwards, because immediately afterwards you're high on endocannabinoids. They used to think it was endorphins, by the way, that made you high after exercise, but they've realized now it's more endocannabinoids. It's also obviously dopamine. It's, it's also cortisol and adrenaline that make you feel energized. So not then, but how do you feel a few hours later when all of that stuff is largely worn off? If basically great, no difference, or maybe slightly better, then it was hormesis. Then it's actually something that strengthened you by giving you a little bit of push. But if it's exhausted, if it's tired, if it's fatigued, if it's run down, if it's achy, if all those things, right, then it's probably built up too much lactic acid. It's probably reduced thyroid hormone too much. It's probably reduced immune function too much. And so, and again, like this is all the stuff where because we're so disconnected from nature and our bodies and all the rest of it, we have to get into all these detailed theories and i'm guilty of that and dr pete was guilty of that but of course before a person could calibrate that just by being in tune with their body right like they would do the amount of exercise that felt good but not excessive and then afterwards they would know it is not excessive because they still feel good and it's as simple as that but these days we're so disconnected that we you know do stuff because this person said to or that person said not to and so we have to kind of do it all from scratch um which is fine because it means we learn lots of interesting stuff along the way but anyway um so yeah i don't know if that addresses chrissy the oh my god that's the opposite of everything i've been told no it it, it does because i've been this is the the science behind it of saying what it triggers by having that um the strenuous exercise combined with fasting i didn't understand i've never heard the science behind that before so now it's like oh there's my why okay don't do that <laughs> whereas before i thought oh it's always good to work out in a fasted state because you're burning more of the stuff that you want to burn but actually not according to this <laughs> I'd say that's definitely untrue because as we talked about when we talked about insulin resistance, it, your body will tend to burn muscle first in that situation and glycogen from stores in your muscles and liver. Um, and the, to the degree that it did, does break down fat lipolysis, that's freeing up free fatty acids, which then have inflammatory effects on the body and increase insulin resistance. So none of that's really good from my point of view. The better way of burning fat is to increase metabolism. 
Um, so yeah, the, the problem with fasting and exercising at the same time is they both are stressors and they're both significant stressors. And so, but I think the reason people do it and often well, what all they do as well, take a pre-workout with like full of caffeine or a coffee or something like that. Right? This is stress, 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 stress. And it's, it's a thing that you feel better than you did before because maybe you woke up, you were bleary eyed, you were tired, you didn't want to do anything. And so you're a little bit in that dorsal vagal state. You're not really engaged with the world. You're not super present. You're just like, oh God. And then you get yourself fired up with coffee, with exercise, with not eating, you get those stress chemicals pumping, you feel a lot better than you did before. And you can do stuff, right? And life isn't all about optimal functioning. It's about, I need to do, go to my job and I need to earn money and I need to look after my children and I need to do this and I need to do that and I need to do that, right? And so you can do stuff. And I think for a lot of people, again, especially women, because they're such, you know, generally nurturing, caring people, they're looking after everyone around them. It's like, it's crucial that I function and how I achieve it is, you know, neither here nor there, as long as I do. Um, but the problem is it's level sustainability. And of course, there's a wide variance with that, you know? I mean, you're doing great, right? Still, <laughs> I was collapsing by the time I was, you know, 20 years younger than you, Chrissy. So uh, depending on your genetic inheritance and all the rest of it, you can get away with a hell of a lot more. But, you know, based on those things, based on tendency for high estrogen, low progesterone, whatever, I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. So I'll go into his next uh, quote on, on exercise here. He says, exertion and stress have in common the need for more fuel. Many factors, including poor nutrition, climate, emotional or physical stress, even excessive running and toxins can cause a progesterone deficiency. That's interesting. Yeah. And you can see why I wanted to talk about progesterone before this quote. Um, we just said, you know, progesterone is one of the number one anti-aging health promoting substances. So Again, if uh, excessive running, as he said, it's especially, as I said, long distance kind of cardio that he was most against can absolutely reduce that thing, which uh, keeps you healthy. Absolutely. Um, he carries on. While jogging became popular for preventing heart disease, we were frequently told by experts how many miles a person has to run to burn off a pound of fat. However, in Russia, physiologists always remember to include the brain in their calculations. And it turns out that a walk through interesting and pleasant surroundings consumes more energy than does harder but more boring exercise. An active brain consumes a tremendous amount of fuel. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the reasons why I've never been close to overweight. Um, and I say this not to show off Ooh, what an active brain I've got. It's actually quite a bad thing from a spiritual practice point of view. It's really hard for me to get my brain down. It's <laughs> it really goes for it. But it does use a lot of fuel. And I think it's the same for you, Chrissy. I don't think you've ever been close to overweight. And you know, when you have a very, very active brain, it uses up a lot of fuel. So this idea that mindless jogging is the thing that's going to burn all the fat off you is incomplete. He carries on to say men and women who are hospitalized for serious sickness typically have greatly increased estrogen levels. Estrogen's role in terminal illness, a vicious circle in which stress decreases the person's ability to tolerate stress is seldom appreciated. Even in rich cultures, protein deficiency, inappropriate exercise, and emotional tension will contribute to premature aging of the individual and damage to the offspring. Stress uses progesterone and can cause menstrual periods to stop. Girls who begin regular exercise such as dancing before puberty have later sexual development. Yeah, and like I said, excessive exercising tends to be especially bad for women. And 
and I follow a lot of women who say, you know, I used to push myself really hard. I used to do intermittent fasting, loads of cardio, you know, cold plunges and all the rest of it. And now I don't do any of that crap and I feel a hell of a lot better. And I think <laughs> this is the, um, you know, hormonal reason for it. Because as I said, although men can be just as bad of excess estrogen than women, especially, uh, you know, as they get older, they can be worse. Um, still, you know, for younger women, it's overall likely to be more damaging to them to exercise uh, excessively because they, you know, a 20 year old woman will definitely tend to have a lot more estrogen than a 20 year old man. He says lactic acid and carbon dioxide have opposing effects. Intense exercise damages cells in ways that cumulatively impair metabolism. There is clear evidence that glycolysis, producing lactic acid from glucose, has toxic effects, suppressing respiration and killing cells. Within five minutes, exercise lowers the activity of enzymes that oxidize glucose. Diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and general aging involve increased lactic acid production and accumulated metabolic mitochondrial damage. Now, people listening to that go, well, what does he mean? Don't get up off the sofa then? No. Like, the <laughs> definition of exercise, but, like, so is walking okay? Yeah, probably. Is running okay? Actually, yeah, maybe. Because, again, the definition is not, like, the activity. The definition is how it makes you feel. If you're so fit that jogging for 20 minutes, like, you're not out of breath at all, you feel totally fine afterwards, no exhaustion, no nothing, then everything that you just read out Chrissy, probably barely applies to you, right? But if you're so unfit that 20 minutes of walking makes you out of breath and exhaust and all the rest of it, then everything that you just said probably does apply to even walking. So uh, I think exercise to the degree that it doesn't have any suppressive effects is beneficial and everyone who talks about that is right. It's just that there's a limit. And I think actually everyone agrees about this. You know, I've followed a lot of personal trainers as well and, you know, they talk about this level of exercise that boost the immune system and there's level of exercise that suppresses the immune system that's well studied and you know well talked about in this day and age but i think it's also true for what dr pete's talking about there's probably a level of it that helps the fire rate but there's level that suppresses there's a level that helps progesterone and there's level that suppresses and i my understanding of the thing that tips it to be excessive is the stress chemicals so if you can do it without raising stress chemicals, then that's better. And of course, because you're trying to avoid raising stress chemicals, that's why doing it fasted is the last time that you'd want to do it, because you're going to be have raised stress chemicals because you're fasted. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Um, he carries on, since lactic acid is produced by the breakdown of glucose, a high level of lactate in the blood means that a large amount of sugar is being consumed. In response, the body mobilizes free fatty acids as an additional source of energy. An increase of free fatty acids suppresses the oxidation of glucose. This is called the Randall effect, glucose fatty acid cycle, substrate, competition cycle, etc. Women with higher estrogen and growth, growth hormone usually have more free fatty acids than men, and during exercise, oxidize a higher proportion of fatty acids than men do. This fatty acid exposure decreases glucose tolerance and undoubtedly explains women's higher incidence of diabetes. So this is really kind of fitting into, as we were talking about in the um, insulin resistance episode, right? Absolutely, yeah. We already discussed that in detail there, but I wanted to throw it in here talking about how exercise actually increases insulin resistance as well. Again, if it's excessive, whatever your definition is and also how it tends to happen more to women again. Yeah, yeah, because I'm understanding a little bit more, even though it's still, you know, very new, that it's then it's that free fatty acid part of it. Uh, yes, based on the Randall cycle. So it's one of those backup, way less effective energy producing systems. Um, and, you know, it's called glycolysis. So that's another one. And that's, he keeps talking about lactate and lactic acid. So uh, with glycolysis, uh, you get way less ATP per unit of glucose. And rather than getting the good byproduct of CO2 that we now understand is good, you get the bad byproduct of lactic acid, which is the thing that makes you feel fatigued. And so that's why I'm saying that's one of the ways to measure if the exercise was excessive, because if it was excessive, you would have gone into glycolysis and then you would have lactic acid build up, which you then feel in the form of soreness or tiredness or both. Yeah, is that the DOMS, the delayed onset muscle soreness that we're, that you're talking about? Like the next day, somebody's like, I had the best workout. Yep. And then the next morning, they can't even walk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes, but um, that can also happen with resistance training. 
which yeah. is which is not so bad. So if it happens as a result of endurance training, I guess technically, yeah. yeah um, he says in this final quote from Dr. Pete, exercise lowers the level of thyroid hormones, partly by accelerating their breakdown. The stress of winter appears to do the same thing. And most people and animals need much more thyroid in the winter than they do in the summer. Exercise lowers human and some animals fertility and winter lowers animals fertility. And so that probably leads us uh, nicely into uh, what we can do is the next section, which is uh, about light. So he draws that connection there between um, how exercise has this suppressing effect on the thyroid glands just as much as darkness does in that they both put a person to a certain degree in a state of hibernation. In the case of darkness, the person's in a state of hibernation and lower energy production because of it's that time of the year that nature signals there's less food around, right? So stop burning as much energy, there's not as much energy available to you. But with exercise, you're going into a state of hibernation because it's like you've burnt up too much energy, now you need to recover, now you need to shut everything down because you overdid it before. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So here we go, we'll go into the next the next uh, quote here from Dr. Pete, light is healthy, darkness is unhealthy. <laughs> So this is obviously uh, an extremely controversial uh, opinion, I guess as much as all of them, because we often think of darkness as healthy, right? We think of darkness as being recuperation, rejuvenation, replenishment, uh, recovery. We think of, um, uh, we, we hear all the time, don't have blue light, make sure, you know, at night, make sure that you sleep in a room that's as dark as possible. And, Dr. P actually disagreed with that to some degree. Now, I am not 100% um, in alignment with him about this. And there is a, a distinction about this as well, which is uh, another one, which uh, maybe we can talk about at the same time, actually, which is, you know, red light is healthy and blue light is unhealthy. That is another one of those quotes. And so that's probably the distinction. So at night, he would say that you would want more red light Whereas during the day, you'd want more blue light, but you'd want more light in general. Now, I don't agree with him 100% about this. I feel like darkness is beneficial. And I think the conclusion that he came to here is because of his obsessive focus on metabolism. Right. What way do you think darkness is beneficial? He obsessively focuses on keeping metabolism high. I think trying to keep metabolism high 24 hours a day is not wise because it doesn't go along with the cycle of nature however he has a very compelling case for why he's right so let's hear him out first before i give my rebuttal okay he says women who had been healthy when they arrived would often develop premenstrual syndrome or arthritis or colitis during their first winter in eugene uh, this is like a, a oregon so a cold dark place compared to uh, where they were before that's the backstory for that one the absence of bright light would create a progesterone deficiency and would leave estrogen and prolactin unopposed beginning in 1966 i started calling the syndrome winter sickness but over the next few years because of the prominence of the premenstrual syndrome and fertility problems in these seasonally exacerbated disorders, I began calling it the pathology of estrogen, estrogen dominance. In the endocrinology classes I taught at the National College of Naturopathic Medicine, I emphasized the importance of light and suggested that medicine could be reorganized around these estrogen-related processes. So he talks a lot about uh, this. And I think it's one, it, I'm not surprised it's one of his theories that hasn't caught on. I'm not surprised that like sugar is good and, you know, exercise is bad. <laughs> it's been met with more popularity than, you know, light is good and darkness is bad. Um, it makes sense from his perspective because he has a lot of evidence. So first of all, um, during a period of darkness is when people are much more likely to have a serious health incident. I don't think I included that in his quotes, but that's, you know, another point. I think three or four in the morning is by far the most likely time for people to have a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. Now, of course, some people could say there's other reasons for that, but he felt that there was a compelling connection to that, to light specifically. So basically, light stimulates um, increased metabolism and darkness slows down metabolism. I think that's the essence of the idea. And so as you can see from that quote, he was talking more about uh, the seasonal variations of light than the light in the day. He was saying that there is a reason that people tend to be depressed, get more illnesses in the winter. It's not necessarily because more viruses are going around. He, he wouldn't say it's even because of the cold. He would say that it's because of the lack of light. 
And of course, there is some evidence for that. Uh, th these days, we would focus more on vitamin, like we would blame all that on vitamin D, right? That there's less vitamin D in the winter. Uh, but, but from his perspective, that's extremely reductive, although he's a big fan of vitamin D. My understanding is that he was talking about is the less light in general would mean the slowing down of the metabolism in general, which would mean that um, there's less ATP energy being created, which means that every system in the body is less effective. The whole thing about metabolism that we've really talked about a lot. I want to ask you a question in this quote where he says the absence of bright light would create a progesterone deficiency. Now, how would that happen to you? I mean, do you do you know what he meant by that or how, what that mechanism is? I don't know the mechanism. No, uh, usually, you know, people would say that the bright light would stimulate serotonin, but he would consider serotonin a bad thing that uh, opposes progesterone and uh, you know, aligns with estrogen prolactin. So yeah, sorry, I don't know the specific mechanism uh, that he had in mind for that. But if I had to guess, it would be related to thyroid. Because as we talked about, thyroid um, tends to... Um, Go down. Well, work with progesterone. Yes, it, whereas, yeah, yeah. Yeah, estrogen and prolactin would oppose, est uh, oppose progesterone. So, you know, he was saying that the darkness would increase the estrogen. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that would be the simple answer to your question. But then, of course, the follow-up question is, well, why does the darkness increase the estrogen? And again, <laughs> if I had to guess, I would guess it's through the mechanism of um, metabolism and thyroid, that the um, lack of thyroid would decrease progesterone, increase estrogen. Because he's already said that in earlier tweets, that that's the correlation. Okay, no, thank you for that distinction. And then how would this... Um possibly play into SAD, you know, the, the winter time, the, um, the seasonal affective disorder. Totally. Yeah. As yeah. I said, that tends to be kind of uh, put down to serotonin, but he would strongly disagree. He would say that that is due to a reduced energy production. Uh, yeah, being the key, reduced metabolism. And then in this final quote from him on exercise, he said, very bright incandescent lights are helpful because light acts on and restores the same mitochondrial enzymes that are governed by the thyroid hormone. In squirrels, hibernation is brought on by the accumulation of unsaturated fats in the tissues, suppressing respiration and stimulating increased serotonin production. In humans, winter sickness is intensified by those same antithyroid substances, so it's important to limit consumption of unsaturated fats and tryptophan which is the source of serotonin. When a person is using a thyroid supplement, it's common to need four times as much in December as in July. Well, that's interesting. Uh, yes, that was his claim. Um, the thyroid doctors that I have come across, they usually don't talk about that, although I did hear one say that, you know, you tend to need quite a lot more in winter than summer, but I've not heard any of them say that it's that extreme in actual clinical practice. Um, I think maybe from the highest, you know, light and temperature to the very lowest double might be more realistic, but I think it definitely could be a significant still. And he's saying there, you know, you want to be more careful to reduce all the thyroid and metabolism suppressing things when there is a lack of light than you would otherwise. So you're going to be able to get away with more seed oils and um, uh, other things that could stimulate... Um, um, lack of uh, thyroid function, like he talks about tryptophan here as a serotonin precursor. Um, you can get away with all of that stuff more when there's light because the light keeps the metabolism high. When the metabolism is low, you're at a lot more danger. And that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's quite quite interesting, the interplay with light and its effect. Is that going into the circadian rhythm at all? Is that feeding into that with the hormone structure? Yeah, and that's why I disagree with him. I do believe what he says that high metabolism is best, but the metabolism does reduce before you go to sleep. You can see that in the drop of temperature of about a degree Fahrenheit or half a degree Celsius. Um, I don't think it's beneficial to keep that metabolism stoked at exactly the same level 24 hours a day. So my understanding is that it's actually beneficial to have that period of you know hibernation known as sleep where it actually is dark and it is cool. There's a lot of evidence for that. Now, can I see his point that if you're in quite a you know, very north or summerly location and suddenly that hibernation period is like 18 hours a day, you know, 18 hours of darkness a day or even more, how that would have negative health outcomes? Absolutely. So the actual point I, you know, I included the quote for, I do agree with. Um, and in that situation, 
would a person would it be a good idea to expose themselves to more light to try and boost the metabolism more and uh, get the person into more of a summer state so they're less than a shutdown hibernating slow metabolism state yes notice he says incandescent light bulbs as opposed to leds because they had a much more you know broad spectrum of light that wasn't just the uh, blue light so the other thing that dr pete did agree with though um you know i i don't have quotes for it included is that you know red light is beneficial and then blue light is generally not beneficial he was more extreme about that than most like if you listen to dr huberman for instance you know he'll talk about how it's good to have a, as much blue light as possible when you first wake up and then you want to reduce it as much as possible before you go to sleep with the idea being when you wake up you want to stimulate cortisol as much as possible when you before sleep you want to reduce it as much as possible like the circadian rhythm the yin and yang night and day and all the rest of it from dr p's perspective that high cortisol is so detrimental that he would never want to spike it so while he didn't you know he wouldn't tell you to avoid sunlight because and sunlight of course is a full spectrum of light including lots of red light and ultraviolet light which actually are beneficial you know one type of ultraviolet light is beneficial all the frequencies of red light are beneficial um but i think if you know the idea of exposing yourself to pure blue light in the morning like with say leds to stimulate cortisol he would consider to be you know extremely bad idea so probably during the day natural sunlight a full frequency of light and then at night because it's not natural to have any blue light reduce the blue light as much as possible to preferably nothing that would probably be the ideal um you know, range of frequencies from his point of view. Ellen, this has been great. I love unpacking all of this with you. It's really expanding my thought process, looking at things differently and creating so much more education around so many things that are highly beneficial, especially just in health, wellness, vitality and everything. So thank you. Thank you for bringing this up and, and us spending time doing this. Now, I wanted to ask you, you know, what have you learned from Ray Pete that's been the most useful so far to you? Yeah, I'll just answer this one quickly. Um, if I hadn't already known about thyroid from other sources, it would be thyroid. Thyroid is a real game changer. And I see a lot of criticism of the followers of Rapey that they follow all his dietary advice and then they gain weight or they don't seem super healthy. And from what I've seen, they're not following his advice on thyroid. Like to me, the thyroid is first. You don't eat as if you have a high metabolism before you actually have a high metabolism. <laughs> I would say that's a mistake. And from having read Ray Pete's work, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say that's exactly what he believed as well. And we've included some quotes about, you know, how enthusiastically he recommended that almost everyone could do with some thyroid and that, you know, you need to have enough thyroid to get you to a place where your metabolism is really fast. Now, he did also recommend that eating in a certain way would boost your metabolism. But I don't think that advice was ever meant to be separate from thyroid. So that would have been, but because I already knew that, the thing that's actually been for me is this distinction about serotonin not being beneficial. Now, if I were a woman, it would probably be the thing about estrogen not being beneficial. And I could see your eyes were literally lighting up when we were talking about that. But um, <laughs> so for me, that hasn't, you know, uh, been as relevant. But the thing about serotonin has because I had digestive problems for so long. So one of the things that I discovered from Ray P in his community is that uh, irritable bowel syndrome and symptoms that are known as that is basically caused by excess serotonin, which is a very, very interesting discovery. And so if I go back to when I brought it to a medical doctor a few years ago, that, what did they say about IBS, which is what they suspected me of. They never diagnosed it because I realized eventually they weren't able to help and stop going to them. But they said that IBS is basically caused by, for some reason, so everyone has these kind of gases going on in their digestive tract, but for some reason, some people are like really sensitive to them and it causes them a lot of pain and discomfort. For other people, it's no big deal. Like they don't even notice it. And so there's these people that are sensitive to it and they don't know why. Well, then, you know, I was following one of uh, Ray Pete's disciples and he talked about how uh, there's a particular drug called um, ciproheptadine, which is very powerfully reduces serotonin as well as um, antihistamine. And that when you give people with IBS that drug, for all of them in this particular study, it went away. All the symptoms of IBS. 
And conversely, there were studies that showed that when they give people SSRIs, which increase serotonin, in a lot of them, it created IBS. And so it seems like serotonin increases IBS and a lack of serotonin reduces IBS. Um, now, this is for all kinds of uh, uh, digestive issues as well. And so when you have, we talked about last time, whether it's good to have a lot of bacteria in your gut and how Dr. Pete did not believe it was. So other than endotoxin, which is the toxin that a lot of the bacteria in the gut, even the so-called okay ones create, one of the other things that these bacteria in our gut create is histamine, which can, if it gets into the bloodstream, can lead to a lot of allergic reactions. And one of the other things that these bacteria create in our digestive tract is noradrenaline, which if it gets into the bloodstream can create a lot of anxiety. And one of the other things that these bacteria create in our digestive tract is serotonin, which if it gets into the bloodstream can have a kind of depressant effect on us or also disassociative kind of effect. So it can make us sad, it can make us disassociated, it can make us feel emotionally flat, it can make us feel shut down, it can make us feel like uh, we don't want to engage with the world. And at the extreme end, it can make uh, it create either paradoxically like a feeling of learned helplessness where we feel like everything is futile, kind of despair, depression, or it can actually go the complete opposite direction and it often veers between the two. And it can go in the direction of like megalomania, narcissism, like I'm the best, I'm the greatest. And it's weird how often <laughs> you'll go between them and I guess in a, a bipolar kind of way and um but it's interesting so so th this is one of the reasons I think why the gut what's going on in the gut can strongly affect how you feel because how you feel is the key thing this really hit home to me recently because someone I know well you know their parent is literally dying of the c word really struggling like terminal and they had been advised all kinds of changes, not by me, but by someone that they should make to their lifestyle. And they haven't followed any of them. And I said to them, you know, it's interesting to me because like, I can't imagine having a terminal diagnosis and not at least trying these things because of the amount of pain that I would be in, right? Because when you're in pain, you're willing to try anything, right? You'd be like, if someone goes, this witch doctor healed me, I'm like, well, you know, let's try it, right? Or this astrologer did, I'll try anything, yeah. right? Reiki, Reiki, you know, it doesn't matter how crazy it sounds when you're feeling fine, when you're in pain, you'll try anything. And they said to me, oh no, person isn't feeling any pain. And I was like, God, yes, yeah, interesting, isn't it? Like you can be almost dying and you can feel fine. And then you can also be in a situation where you can go to the doctor and they're like, there's nothing wrong with you. They probably think you're a hypochondriac and yet you've got all of these issues and yet all the blood tests come out as fine. So it's interesting that how we feel does not necessarily correlate to how sick we are. So what does it correlate to? Well, I think it correlates to the level of hormones and neurotransmitters that are actually in our blood supply and in our nervous system. And so that is why the gut can so powerfully affect how we feel, because if we have these organisms in the gut creating loads and loads of serotonin, for instance, and you know, there's like a microbiome test like by a company called Biomsite, which I recommended that will tell you based on your gut bacteria, we expect you'll have this level of histamine, this level of serotonin, this level of um, noradrenaline, whatever. Often they'll, like I've looked at it with different people and be like, we expect that you'll have like 50 times as much histamine as average or 20 times as much serotonin as average. Like, so the variance is huge, right? If you have a lot of a certain type or certain types of bacteria, you can have way more than average. And of course, if you have way more than average of a stress chemical, and then you have leaky gut, or intestinal permeability, that's a lot of that getting into your blood supply. And that's really gonna affect how you feel. And so I tried not ciproheptadine, but another thing called metagoline, which suited me better, which is popular in the rape world, which increases, sorry, which increases uh, dopamine and also decreases serotonin. And not only did it make me feel much better emotionally, you know, all the best of it psychologically, but it also made any IBS symptoms disappear. It's like, huh. <laughs> interesting you know after all the things i've tried that that would be the thing and just by you know tweaking those neurotransmitters so because of experience i'd had researching stuff again way before i started reading ray pete i already had this idea that excess serotonin might be a bad thing but 
I had no idea it might have been causing all of my IBS type symptoms. So that was hugely, hugely helpful. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, because you think, oh, serotonin, everybody needs so much serotonin. It's a calming neurotransmitter. If you don't have enough serotonin, you're not going to be calm. You're not going to feel happy. You're not going to feel all of this. It's another one of those. It's often calming, right? If you're so depressed, you don't want to leave your house. You're, I don't know, you're less trouble to everyone around you. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So if you feel so full of despair, you don't want to get out of bed, you know, you're, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, I mean, and that, I think that's a lot of it, right? If we're talking about social engineering, you know, it's like what makes someone so crazy that they're considered, you know, that they have mental health issue in section and, and, and thrown in a psychiatric facility, right? Generally, it's because they're either a danger to themselves because they try to kill themselves, hurt themselves, or because they're so bothersome to those around them that someone eventually says, we've got to get rid of them, you know, let's, let's uh, put them away. That's basically it. A person could go, be going through all kinds of internal anguish. And so long as they don't actually bother the people around them too much, and so long as they don't actually attempt to, you know, obviously directly hurt themselves, they just can carry on that way for years and decades, right? And so... And so for people in those psychiatric institutions, often they don't fix them. They just give them, you know, Thorazine or, you know, or whatever the latest generation of that is, you know, things to basically just uh, numb them emotionally. And things that increase serotonin, whether it's SSRIs or 5-HTP supplements, are not that different. They will numb you. So if you are in a state of turmoil and upset and anxiety and you know, drama and overwhelm, will it calm you the hell down? Absolutely it will. But it will make you feel flat. It will make you feel, you know, a lack of meaning, a lack of, you know, uh, enthusiasm for life, all the rest of it. And yeah, it can suddenly go a really bad direction, which is the danger of those things. It, yeah, it can turn you violent. It can turn you suicidal. It can turn you, you know, uh, uh, it can disassociate you so much that suddenly you know, you start thinking that life is not real, it's just a video game and start shooting people. I mean, that's the uh, that's the extreme side of being uh, disassociated is you can go too far into disassociation and then feel like, you know, you're not real, other people aren't real, nothing is real. But if you disassociate people just enough, it will shut them up and stop them bothering you. And maybe that's, um, maybe that's the plan. Yeah, I mean, it's also, it's, it's, it's for me, when you shared that about, you know, this, uh, again, you know, with Ray Pete saying, you know, serotonin is a stress chemical. It's like, oh, hang on a second. You know, it's another way of looking at it. Yeah, the what, what if, what if, oh, maybe if it is this, then that, ah, oh, that's making sense. So that's what I've really, um, appreciated on this journey and you're absolutely right the, est the estrogen and, and progesterone thing would be mine <laughs> for sure <laughs> <laughs> and um and you know and the good thing is it's not a theory that you have to you know debate endlessly in your mind you can just try it as i did right you can take lots of 5-htp see how you feel sometimes it's really really bad although generally not as bad as ssris but i know like um one of the people who i learned from who's one of the people the pioneers of the peptide world he said you know a friend of his took five of htp once and went insane and never recovered you know like these things do happen although they're relatively rare more common with ssris but the easiest way to see it is take something that strongly reduces serotonin if it's such a relaxation wonderful happy chemical that should make you feel r terrible right and yet in practice it actually doesn't so that's what I think is interesting. Yeah, because sometimes too, I have seen it where um, because if people have trouble sleeping, then they try to take 5-HTP to help with that. I used to recommend it. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. And it, but it's the same thing, right? It's numbing you. It's calming you down in the sense of, you know, stopping you from being so worked up because it's putting you into this kind of disassociated state. It, you know, it, it, is a disassociated state preferable to a psychotic episode? Probably. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and on a sure. practical level, is like a, a somnambulistic state better than a state of intense anxiety? Probably, right? If you've been for intense anxiety, then feeling all flat is an improvement. So, but just as we mistake, you know, like a rush of adrenaline as being an improvement from depression, we probably, you know, um, interpret uh, uh, like a shutdown sleepwalking state as being an improvement of having a panic attack. But and in each case, it is an improvement experientially but it's not a resolution. Yeah, good point, good point. With everything that you have learned in your, um, you know, 
getting to know Dr. Pete's research and, you know, doing some of your research on your own within the things that he's shared. Is there anything or do you think that there's something like that he got wrong or like the biggest thing in your opinion that he got wrong? Yeah, well, no one's perfect. Um, and <laughs> time for if I made any Ray Pete fans, I'll probably lose them at this point. But um, what I've observed is whenever there's a genius who kind of discovers stuff that no one else has thought of, um, they often get very fixated on that particular thing. And I've known people like that personally. I think you have as well, Chrissy. Um, Buteko, who I mentioned in a different segment, he was another example like that, and his followers. If you talk to a Buteko follower, anything that increases carbon dioxide on the body is good. Anything that reduces it is bad. And they'll go to real extremes about that. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll never over breathe. They'll try not to talk too much. You know, they'll never take a deep breath. They'll never breathe through their mouth. Some of them I know will like uh, fall asleep sitting up because it conserves CO2. They get like really crazy in that direction. And this is really common, right? Like when people discover that, I don't know, um, eating a plant, you know, they like they feel better eating a plant-based diet than a normal diet, then they're like 100% no animal foods. And if you're doing that for a moral reason or whatever, that's fine. But, uh, well, it's not just fine, it's great, good for you. But, you know, people get extreme about things. So for Dr. Peter, it was all about speeding up metabolism, right? And the one thing that I think he got wrong that's significant that I've observed is... He kind of simplified it to that which speeds up metabolism is good and that which slows it down is bad. Now, while I genuinely obviously believe that, and I've taught that in other episodes, like the episode we did on metabolism, there is a definite exception to that, which is poisons will speed up your metabolism. If you take a non-life-threatening but significant quantity of arsenic or mercury or asbestos or whatever, your metabolism will increase, your core temperature will increase, your heart rate will increase, those classic indicators of metabolism will increase. Does that mean you've benefited yourself? I would say no, of course. And in fact, Dr. P a lot of the time saw through people making that same mistake in different areas, right? Like we just talked about with serotonin, we talked about with estrogen, um, like we talked about stress chemicals, he could generally see you know, just because something raises stress chemicals, it doesn't mean it's actually a good thing. Um, now, what am I talking about specifically? Because people might be saying, ah, oh, when he was against all these things. Okay, let me be specific. Here's one example. Vitamin A or retinol. He was a big fan of retinol or vitamin A. Um, I know he had personal experience where he had some kind of um, abnormal cell growth and he used a high dose of retinol and it went away. And I can understand when a person goes through that, um, they could, you know, start to get very favorable feelings towards that particular compound. Um, my understanding of why that might be the case is because retinol breaks down to retinoic acid, um, which can break down to 13 cis retinoic acid, which is actually a chemotherapy agent. So uh, it's not crazy that vitamin A would help with that. But is it a good idea to take a key therapy agent every day of your life? No, right? And so I won't do too much justifying about why I feel like vitamin A is a bad thing. We have a whole episode with that, which is the uh, uh, interview I do with uh, Grant Jinru on how actually I believe most people have an excess of vitamin A, that it's toxic. Vit like high levels of vitamin A does reduce estrogen. I know it does various things other than increase metabolism, which Dr. Pete was a fan of. But as I said, I think it's more of a poison. Um, I know this is going to be a lot more controversial, but I think coffee, at least in the quantities that he recommended it and used it, is a similar story. Uh, I'm actually surprised that he came to this conclusion. I think it must be due to his personal experience, not the science, because... You know, he, he was using a lot. He was using, I used to have a crazy amount of coffee and he was using even more than me. He would use like 30, 40 cups or something a day, apparently, according to his own experience and um, according to his own testimony. Not that I was there, but that's what I've read him say. And, you know, co the, there are beneficial things in coffee, but the main mechanism of action of caffeine, the main active ingredient in coffee is by um, reducing adenosine, which is this... Uh, I guess, metabolism slowing, but also relaxing uh, neurochemical. 
And so when you do that, it absolutely does increase stress chemicals. Now, he had ways of kind of trying to mitigate that. He would encourage people to have sugar with coffee or honey, a simple sugar. He would encourage people to have milk or MCTs in large quantities or cream, uh, which would slow, you know, the, um, the, the strength of the impact it has, just like the bulletproof crowd do these days. But I, I feel like, yeah, in some cases he was biased where he was recommending things that were poisons because, or at least poisons at the dose he was recommending them because they obviously genuinely had a men metabolism boosting effect. This is not a new thing, by the way, throughout the ages, the wisest people in history have been doing this, you know, um, yeah, mercury used to be commonly given as a medicine. Arsenic used to be commonly given as a medicine. I was not exaggerating earlier. That literally used to happen a lot. And I think it's for that same reason. And actually maybe sometimes it worked. Maybe if someone has a death door of an infection, give them a dose of arsenic, it would speed up the metabolism. Maybe their immune system would fight, you know, their core temperature would go up. Maybe their immune system would start functioning better. They were able to fight off the infection and they would live. I'm not even against that. I'm not even against, you know, I'm not saying that they were necessarily always wrong about that. But what I'm saying is it may work. It may save someone's life, but that doesn't mean it is a beneficial thing to have. It's still a poison, even if it's effective at boosting metabolism, even if that sometimes has a really profoundly healing effect. So... I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've seen that I personally think that he got wrong. And you can extend it out to other things in terms of his dietary recommendations and stuff as well. I don't think everything that he recommended dietary wise was beneficial for the same reason. But yeah, that's my opinion right now. Who knows? I may change it at some point. I don't think I'll change my opinion on vitamin A because of the extensive research I've done on it. But maybe on caffeine, I will. I'm not as certain that I'll, I'll stick to that one. But I think... Um, he, let's just say Dr. Peter's right about everything. Still be wary of assuming that everything that increases your metabolism is good for you. <laughs> it may well be that you're trying something like, oh, wow, it's really increasing my metabolism. I feel great. Just realize that maybe because it's poisoning you, you've got to be wary. Yeah, no, I was surprised about the caffeine because I know my own journey with caffeine of letting that go because I was not able to... Um sleep at night so that was something i definitely had to go let go because it was just inhibiting that so much and also um yeah just with the anxiety or you know feeding into that stress which i'm trying to lower so it just yeah was not not um heading me in the right direction of where i wanted to go so so what he'd say to that is that that's a sign that your metabolism isn't fast enough and strong enough and that you have to follow more of his advice. And so this is the thing where we can't be sure 100% that he was wrong until we mm -hmm. have like a superhuman metabolism and try it for ourselves. I suspect he probably still is wrong, <laughs> but, uh, but that would be the thing. But what I don't appreciate is a lot of people, as I said, not following his metabolism boosting advice first and just starting to take lots of sugar, eat lots of coffee, consume loads of carbs, and then, you know, gaining weight, I've heard of even people becoming diabetic, all the rest of it, because they're, they're putting the cart before the horse, right? Got to optimize that metabolism first, reduce the estrogen, reduce the insulin, you know, increase your progesterone, increase your thyroid, increase your testosterone, got to get all of that in a better place, increase your carbon dioxide, like we talked about in an earlier segment. You've got to get all that in place first before you start taking a load of things that might be a poison to you. In the same way, you've got to get a lot of things in place before you start exercising harder than you should do. Who knows? Maybe very strenuous exercise for hours a day is potentially beneficial, but you have to be in a really, really strong position to do that. Maybe lots of sugar and caffeine is good for you, but you have to be in a really strong position to have it be. I was going to ask if there are any final thoughts, but I think that kind of sums <laughs> it up. But just in case, if there's anything else you want to add before we uh, come to a close. You know, I've shared lots of controversial perspectives. I've obviously given my take, but I'd love to hear other people's take. Um, if you have any comments, please leave them underneath. And also uh, feel free to ask, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? If you want to, um, uh, you know, link to other people's videos that have comments on any of these issues, I'd be interested to see what other people have to say. Uh, I just want to get to the truth. You know, I'm not trying to push a specific agenda here. I like, you know, I have a bit of a predilection for enjoying controversial opinions, but not because, you know, I like to upset people just because I like, you know, finding out the truth about things that like maybe um, are not well known. That's, that's really interesting to me. It's really interesting to me that almost all of us could be walking around believing something 
and it not being true. Yeah, I guess my final thought would be this. If all of this is nonsense and all of the basic theories about everything that are in the mainstream or the kind of mainstream alternative are true, then why are so many people still suffering? Why are so many people still obese? Why are so many people still having chronic, suffering from chronic diseases? And I know the usual kind of dogmatic answer to that is because not everyone's following my diet perfectly yet or not everyone's doing my protocol yet or whatever it might be. But that's possible. But it's also possible that the reason is because we're working on fundamentally faulty presuppositions like the idea that nitric oxide is good and CO2 is bad or like the idea that estrogen is good and progesterone is bad or unnecessary. So maybe it's just that our fundamental assumptions about the way things are is wrong. And if that's the case, it means no matter how clever we are, no matter how disciplined we are, no matter how well read and researched we are, if everything that we do is within a false presupposition, then it's not going to work or it's not going to be sustainable. So that's why I like questioning the very foundations of things because it's so much easier to get better and make improvements if you stop working on a supposition that isn't true. Like, for instance, you know, you try to be healthy, you're exercising, you're eat, eating better than most people, you're this, you're that, you're not smoking, you're not drinking much, whatever and yet you're still unhealthy. It's very easy to go, oh, it's not fair. It's very easy to blame your genes, which might be, you know, one of the reasons. But what if it's that you're having loads of, uh, you know, serotonin that's making you worse? What about if you, what about if you're, ha you know, um, having loads of uh, uh, estrogen, which is making you worse? What about if you're having loads of vitamin A that's making you worse or whatever, right? Like, these basic things like you think you're doing something good but actually you're making yourself worse and you don't even realize it or the opposite you know um you're avoiding something because you believe it's bad for you but actually it's the very thing that would help to heal you that's something that's important to understand that could that could revolutionize things for you so that's why it's always good to be open well said well said i know there's a couple of things that we didn't quite get to and maybe we can save that for a later time if we do do it hopefully but um we do also want to say thank you everyone for joining us today it's our pleasure to be able to bring these episodes to you and again as alwyn said please you know put your comments down in that comment section and ask us some questions we're here to you know do some more research on your behalf and bring these things to you so so please do comment below and then also to hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode and we will see you next time hey i hope you enjoyed that video you may have noticed i recommended a few different videos in that episode and one of the ones i recommend is just here if you want to click there or another one i recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next